we have started the recording good morning guys we'll give a couple of more minutes and we'll get started yeah this will get seen by lots of bit on youtube right while we wait for people to join in so um for those of you who already don't know there is hyperledger mentorship program currently going on and and uh, the proposal for which is still open it's open till march 15th so you get opportunity to propose a project and if your project gets through then you get to work with uh, mentees you get to mentor the new mentees at hyperledger foundation and this is also opportunity for you to get involved or probably propose the ideas that you have been holding on the ideas that you may have with you that you feel like hey this is probably a good idea to get involved and and probably i need a feature like this in this project could be fabric could be bevel i know we have uh, a lot many people using besu as well in the india community so this probably is a better opportunity uh, for you to get involved so do reach out to anybody who you know from the chapter they will guide you Okay, we'll get started in one more minute. All right, I think we can get started now. Hey, um hello all. Good morning again. Welcome to Hyperledger India chapters. Hyperledger Connect India 2023. I know we have been quiet for some period for last 2 3 months, but I think we are we were holding on our best sessions and best technical papers and and best presentations for this occasion. And and today we have um our esteemed guests and and i think um we don't need more introduction to this person and and he has been helping with all our events and any time we have any request we just need to send an email or ask and it's it's always um and coming uh, with much more uh, like i don't know with with all the help needed and with anything that we request for right so it's it's none other than julian garden of course and all of you already know probably and and thanks julian again for honoring us and joining us today um on 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 a weekend and uh with us joining today we also have daniel ababosa who's general manager for blockchain and identity at Hi and um she's a uh, executive for hyperledger foundation and and she holds a larger portfolio as well that's what i learned from julian recently um and 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 thanks janiela for joining in i know it's a uh, late night for you and um, and and yeah thanks for always helping us supporting us and and the legend india chapter and with that uh, so today we'll be having um today we have a good uh, a, a big announcement coming up so we are uh, you will all learn about uh, what's happening at hyperledger india chapter and how you all can be involved 
and there is there's more space there is more room for you all to be involved and, and engage yourself every day and apart from that we are going to learn um uh, great presentations today and today we have uh, ravi who will be sharing his uh, mentorship experience with all of us and we have aditya who will be sharing how we can use um a pluggable ca which is non um hyperledger fabric ca right so um so that's going to be interesting technical topic as well and following we have team from zeev who will be sharing how somebody can use hyperledger fabric and set up in their enterprise networks so i know it's a it's a jam packed agenda for the day and looking forward to uh, hearing all the sessions and uh, to kick it off i think now i'd like to welcome julian um to speak a few words i first have to get off mute well thank you arun and thank you for everything that you've done right so uh which we'll cover a little bit uh, in a in a bit right um but uh, welcome everybody to this uh, uh indian chapter uh, event i'm going to go through a few slides so uh, vikram do you want to show the slides or 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 shall i go through the slides you had you had the latest slides right do you want to present them or i can do that or do Just you or, or do you want to give them to me mm. Uh, oh, they are. They're there. Actually, did you where? Where did you? Sorry. <laughs> just give me a sec. I'm just there. Yep, I'm there now. <clears throat> Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Indian chapter today. So let's go. And, and as we know, today uh, we have two uh, two uh, uh, leaders. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, firstly, we've got to mention. I think uh, somebody else is going to be joined in this alumni. This, uh, you know. Uh, um, uh, uh, reputable alumni of, of retired chapter chairs. We have a more uh, who uh, we started this all with back in, I think, 2018, um, who now at Dragonfoot AI and AJ also then uh, also took that on as a joint leadership. So I firstly, I think we'd have to say thank you uh, to the retired chapter chairs. And may we have another one, maybe soon. <laughs> uh, so as, as, as uh, uh, this says, uh, to be honest, I can't read it all. <laughs> but the world, the world is one family and and all are are welcome uh, at hyperledger and that is a mantra that we have said since the very beginning uh, our diversity is our strength uh, and uh, we may think global but we truly act global act local right so thank you uh, the community for doing that so um hello world so next uh, we have re many regional chapters uh, so the india chapter was the first one and i think next slide talks a little bit to that but the model that uh, was created here uh, at, uh, at in India uh, is the model that has gone, uh, you know, gone around the world, right? Uh, and uh, as you saw, we have many Italy, we have Latin America, we have um, uh, the Italian chapter uh, in Africa, uh, and, and 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 many other places around the world, right? Uh, so uh, and very vibrant communities. If you go back to the one before, so no, next one. So basically, this was proposed in 2018. I remember when, uh, actually, I think I did the technical steering chair. It came out of the ideas of a mall. It came out of the ideas that we had many meetups. But how do we as India come together uh, to do something more significant than even we're doing uh, at a regional? So this is to pull together India, which, as we know, India, some of the... the, the the most best developers are some of the best developers in the world right and some of the you know, greatest communities uh that we wanted to to empower uh to to get involved and and lead many things that we're doing at hyperledger it's proposed in mid 2018 uh started in in 2019 we just had our fourth anniversary uh which you all may have joined uh, uh earlier uh and now uh we're, we're just going from from growth to growth right next slide so the goals uh, and these came from from the very beginning. And by the way, this is as I said, the slide. It's open to everyone. Uh, we do have uh, we have weekly calls every Thursday at three p.m. IST. Uh, so please do get involved. It's very easy to get involved. Uh, there's many uh, uh, many materials that you can uh, help you do that. It's really to help the adoption of hyperledger projects, which, as you know, uh, we have many many projects, and we also have many labs. Uh, so we want to help promote the adoption of those to help accelerate uh, blockchain technology and 
blockchain for business for all of us, grow the user and developer community in India, um, and provide promote technical contributions. So a lot of people consume open source, but how do you contribute back technically and also in other ways, like uh, uh, we're going to hear about the leadership here of contributing uh, to the community through, through many other means. And then provide a, a platform guidance for support and collaboration of the community, uh, very much driven by the leadership and our members and others uh, in, in, uh, in India. So please, anyone watching who hasn't got involved, you can easily get involved and uh, you can do that through our calls uh, at 3 p.m. IST uh, regularly every Thursday. And just, just connect with any, anyone here is always going to help you and guide you. Next step, next slide. So yeah, we have, uh, and this was set up, I think two years ago, uh, the Hyperledger India Chapter Student Society. So uh, we understand uh, the, the necessity, not the, the, the opportunity of working uh, with universities uh, or the, the new talent and, and, and new developers uh, and new ideas. Uh, and, and we very much want to, to, to help them get involved in what we're doing and contribute uh, to, to, to this global uh, community. So the Student Society, if you're a student, please do get involved. Uh, we have, have that there specifically for you and I think that is just growing and growing as well right and we've got some leadership we're going to talk today who, who are going to take the mantle and help drive that uh, and help grow that uh, for the community and for the benefit of the community next slide uh, yeah you can watch everything that we do here you can go back in history if you want if you come I don't know there'll ever be a, a history book written on a chapter who knows but we have it all documented out there and you can see the stuff you can see that the events activities actually a lot of stuff was done during the, the pandemic right uh, I think the Indian chapter really adapted we, we even did online uh, hackathons really so and this and innovative stuff to help keep the community going through some some of those challenging times we had through through covid but you all the content is there and very rich in contact and please like today's video you'll be able to see that uh, on hyperledger's youtube okay next slide i think i'm now going to hand over uh, to uh, my boss and the general manager <laughs> and the executive director of uh, hyperledger i'm going to hand it over to uh, um, uh, daniela who's up in the middle of the night uh, thank you very much for being here, Daniela. I'm going to go to pass to you. Thank you. It's still early. It's 9 p.m. on a Friday night. And, you know, <laughs> I, I've said this a million times. This, this is one of my favorite things is talking to our community. So, uh, Julian, thank you for all your support and your continued leadership uh, for the community there in India. Um, you know, I have to say that, um, you know, one of the highlights and one of the things that I talk about all the time is the community that the India chapter has grown over the last few years, you know, starting in 2019, as Julian mentioned, um, from 2020 to 2022, we actually saw 24% growth in the India regional chapter community. So across all of India with all the meetups and all the work that we've done, um, we've seen an increase in Hyperledger members joining from the region. And we thank all the members that have joined us to help support the work that the Hyperledger Foundation has done. And today I think we're close to 15,000 community members, at least in the meetup community world. Um, and that's pretty amazing. And the way that we see growth um, in the India chapter and in the developers and in the interest that we're seeing in the marketplace, um, I think is really truly uh, because of all of you, um, all of the work that everyone that has been participating, that has been contributing uh, to the India regional chapter has done. So, you know, first I wanna thank everybody uh, who has done such a fantastic work uh, in growing our community in keeping in place. Uh, for those of you who are, might be new to our community, um, last year we also published an ebook that really highlighted what was going on with the India regional community. And um, I, I'll put it on the chat, you can download it there. Um, but it's really spectacular. And it's not just about events. And, uh, you know, I have to say, I do watch these events uh, very often on a Saturday morning when I go for my long walks down to the beach. Um, I might listen to some of these events and I love the presentations and the work that uh, everyone does. Um, and I think that, you know, we need to keep in mind that there are people watching from around the world what 
the developer community is doing in India, the contributions, uh, the mentorship programs, Arun mentioned very early on the mentorship programs that we have, you know, it is not just about, um, you know, uh, showing up at meetups, but actually contributing. Um, and I want to once again, thank you. Uh, but, you know, overall, as we look through the last few years, um, you know, I want to thank Arun specifically, um, who has been one of the India chapter leads working with the rest of, of the community um, for really being a leader in um, in not only the regional chapter, but globally as well. Um, so Arun, hats off to you. Um, I am so excited. I'm not going to have to wake up in the middle of the night to talk to you any longer and vice versa, since you're, you're now stateside. Um, and I think, you know, you'll continue to be a leader. Obviously, Arun, for those of you who don't know, is currently part of the Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee. So he's one of our leaders in our uh, uh, Technical Governance Committee. Uh, and I think it's fantastic. So um, Arun, thank you for everything that you've done over the years for the Hyperledger India chapter. Um, and um, I am sure we're going to continue seeing some great, great stuff with you. But with that, you know, there's new leadership and a great opportunity. And I'm just delighted to see the kind of leadership that we're seeing with the new uh, chapter leads and the different committees that we've set up for the Hyperledger India chapter. And I thank, you know, Arun and Kamlesh and the rest of you for working together over the last few weeks to come together and put together uh, this leadership team and it's really fantastic and I look forward I, I look forward to working with every single one of you um so first um and we're going to go uh Kamlesh in a little bit is going to give us an overview a little bit more detail of everybody's background but let's talk a little bit about who our new Hyperledger India chapter leads are um so Kamlesh is going to continue to uh, be leading um our India chapter um as well as other other groups within the Hyperledger Foundation so Kamlesh thank you so much for all that you do um excited to see Vikram who also has been contributing to the community for a long time taking on a new leadership role as part of a chapter leads uh, for the uh, chapter. So thank you, Vikram, for all that you've done in the past and your continued leadership as well. And I'm very, very much delighted to see Deepka, um, who I had the pleasure of meeting this year at the Hyperledger Global Forum in uh, Dublin uh, when she came to really represent what the India regional community has been doing, and more importantly, what uh, developers in 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 the region um, and globally um, have been uh, participate, how they have been participating in Hyperledger. Um, Deepta, it's an honor, and I'm so excited to see you taking on a leadership role here at the Hyperledger uh, Foundation. Um, and I'm just extremely excited to, you know, hopefully be able to work with you even more closely. Um, as we move forward. So congratulations. Uh, and I think there's a little clap sign on the, on this Zoom. Let me do that. Congratulations uh, through the mm -hmm. new chapter leads um, and myself and Julian and the rest of the Hyperledger staff uh, are looking forward to working with all of you. So thank you so much for stepping up um, and for uh, volunteering your time um, and um, your, your, your resources uh, to the foundation as well. So thank you so much. And we'll get more details about all these great folks. So next slide, please. Um, this year, we're also doing um, uh, some lead, some um, some uh, leads in the India chapter. And not only do I support this, I think that is so important as this com community continues to grow, um, that leadership is very targeted in different domains and how we assist and how we support our communities. Um, so congratulations and a welcome uh, to our new uh, event and engagement leads. And we got a Rajesh and Ritu. Um, we're looking forward to working with you and uh, making sure that you're successful in the work that you're going to do in the community. And once again, you know, a community of over 15,000 people doing events and engagements like we are doing this evening or this morning for you all um, is really important. So I really am looking forward to the contributions uh, that these leads uh, will have for our uh, chapter. Uh, so welcome. Um, obviously, in, you know, not just in India, but worldwide, the academic community is so special to us, and we want to continue to uh, support and provide resources to it. So I want to welcome um, our new Student Society leaves, uh, leads. 
uh, for the India Regional Chapter, uh, Ravi and Pramod, um, thank you. Um, the as I said before, the academic community and students are our future, um, and we want to make sure that we're providing the resources and the opportunities for them to step up through things like, for example, our mentorship programs um, and other ways that students around the world can really participate and contribute to our project. So uh, thank you, Ravi and Pramod, for taking on this leadership role as well. Um, with developers, we are a developer ecosystem and having developer advocates that really, you know, over, you know, the, 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 the India chapter events, um, the different things that the uh, the group does, you know, making sure that we have developers, um, uh, advocates that reach out to the developer ecosystem. Um, so I'm very happy with this category. And I think it's a great opportunity for these three new leaders um, to take on uh, responsibilities and roles that will really help continue to grow our developer ecosystem. Um, so Kartke and Adika and Nidhi, uh, welcome to the Hyperledger Foundation. And we're very excited to have you as part of the developer advocates uh, team um, and to see the kind of work that our community can continue to grow. Um, and maybe that I can come in next year and say, hey, we grow from 50,000 community members to 20,000 community members. And I think the developer advocate work um, is going to really, really uh, assist us with that. So thank you so much for volunteering um, and for taking a leadership role in our foundation. And all right. Um, so once again, I just want to thank everybody. And I do listen to many of your presentations. You know, um, I am looking forward to visiting India this year. Um, we will be, you know, sharing over the next few months uh, when, when, and how. Um, but I think it's long overdue that our team uh, here, our staff, uh, goes to India. So I look forward to uh, meeting everyone when I do come out. Um, and I want to thank everybody for their continued support um, and uh, the contributions to the Hyperledger Foundation. Um, so I'd like to introduce Kamlesh, one of our uh, chapter leads here uh, for the India chapter, to take us through a little bit about um, who the leaders are and how we can look at them and kind of help assist them. It's all of us together in helping assist our leadership in being uh, successful in um, this new chapter of the India chapter. Uh, so Kemlesh, uh, once again, thank you for everything that you do across the Hyperledger Foundation, um, and over to you. Yeah, uh, yeah. You. I guess uh, you know before oh. Kamlesh starts, you know uh, I'll introduce Kamlesh, and then you know Kamlesh can probably oh, introduce the rest of us. Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, then let me try that again. Vikram, sorry, I didn't take the cue. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you for working on the slides as well. And Vikram, go ahead um, if you can introduce Kamlesh, um, and thanks again for your leadership. Go ahead, Vikram. Sure, thanks. So essentially, you know, Kamlesh needs no introduction. You know, uh, he is a TEDx speaker, and you know, he is CTO at you know uh, for blockchain art. You know, Snapper Future Tech. He is, you know, one of the, you know, uh, most influential people, you know, especially in the blockchain community. He is among the top 30, right? He is, you know, currently, you know, uh, you know, uh, he's already a lead of India, India chapter and, he, you know, he'll continue being that. And previously he was also member of, you know, Hyperledger Technical Sharing Committee, you know, uh, till last year. And he has been, you know, playing active role across the Hyperledger community and the blockchain community. I see him every day, you know, contributing to blockchain and, you know, adoption of blockchain and, you know, uh, and, you know, making sure that, you know, blockchain reaches, you know, the masses, right? So I've seen him, you know, do, do so much and, you know, uh, make sure, you know, the newsletters are out, make sure that, you know, everyone, you know, has what they need to, you know, contribute towards blockchain and, it, and its adoption. Right. And he is currently also, you know, the vice chair for, you know, uh, Hyperledger Climate Action and Accounting SIG. He is also part of, you know, Trade Finance SIG and, you know, Hyperledger Global Forum, you know, committee member as well. Uh, you know, he is he mentored at Apiary, you know, Blockchain COE and as, you know, was previously, you know, Hyperledger mentor uh, as well in last year, you know, he mentored, you know, multiple such, you know, projects as part of that mentorship forum, right? So thank you, Kamlesh, for all the contributions that you have done and, you know, looking forward to working with you. So uh, over to you, Kamlesh, now. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Vikram, for the introduction. So uh, before going to the new team structure, I would like to thank uh, Dengla and Julian to joining us and uh, helping Indian community to grow at this scale. And uh, last of all, thank you to the Arun uh, from the last two years, how we drive the community and contributing and getting together our the community. And now 
we are we need the community to grow at the different level so and because and and that's their purpose we come with a new structure which i don't suggest earlier we should have a different different roles because as a two leads and two person can't lead the community we need the community architect and community larger community behind to make it at the next level so for this we uh, started to uh, think about like what are the different roles and uh, things we can do so uh, arun uh, uh, the next slide so uh, for the addition of the india chapter lead so we added uh, vikram so vikram is a active uh, community participant from last 3 4 years he is uh, handling the currently event management or event lead and directly working with julian and david and uh, all about events in india chapter and is quite active so currently he is a uh, part of the scl tech uh, is a scl technology is a blockchain practice lead and quite active in a uh, uh, blockchain community in india and uh, vikram is also has been mentored to the blockchain for blockchain at hyperledger mentorship programs so uh, welcome uh, vikram to the india chapter league uh, yes slide. thank you kamlesh and deepika is our new face so uh, because we need the uh, someone uh, young lady to drive the blockchain and drive the indian community at the different level and different thought process because we new the same new new brand and new thought process of what can be done so uh, deepika is part of the uh, walmart global tech india uh, he is a sees colleague of uh, arun and active member of the hyperledger uh, globally and uh, he is he has been there in the global forum last year and presenting the indian community and uh, leading the women in blockchain events in india and there's a reason we uh, included her to lead the india chapter and her new thoughts and new vision maybe we could uh, take india to new new level so i'm looking forward to working with everyone yeah next slide okay so uh, like suppose we as a different uh, meetups and different events there is a plan in india and we keep keep doing in the indian community so to do this thing individually and as a, as a broader level as a as a next level we uh, added two different uh, leads to drive this particular uh, this particular segment so rajesh krishnan uh, who is a part of the dell technologies in india a distinguished engineer there and he has been in the community from quite some time and contributing in in terms of managing events or contributing to the indian community and uh, so and has been mentored to the uh, hyperledger challenge ambassador and uh, hyperledger mentor mentorship program last year so welcome rajesh to the uh, indian community thank you looking forward to connect more events and uh, meet the target of daniela that she said 20k mm -hmm. <laughs> <You got laughs> <it. laughs> yeah and next one so uh, ritu uh, ritu is quite active so uh, ritu is currently uh, already uh, heading and leading some hyperledger hyderabad events with kartike and uh, she uh, she has been active in the community uh, like other member and and that is the basis of involving and giving the new responsibility to take this forward uh, she has been uh, as associate director of the big loss of big loss of an indian uh, multinational company and uh, uh, she she uh, she has been uh, active in the blockchain community as a as a speaker as a as a uh, hyperledger challenge program and hyperledger uh, ambassador program so welcome to ritu indian team and this thank you i'm looking yeah. forward to work with everybody thank you yeah thank you and uh, because uh, arun and uh, sengits uh, and uh, we started uh, student chapter society i think two years before and uh, it is needed some kind of boost up to uh, take this name because in indian community there are uh, millions of students engineering students we can say and we can reach out to them and uh, get involved in the hyperledger community and uh, especially the developer community but currently uh, every every university in india looking forward to get engaged with the open source and uh, uh, developer community so, I I I see many engineering colleges and universities. So uh, 
or everybody having the IEEE chapters or Google developer community. So I think it's a good place to be having a hyperledger India chapter experience society at the each engineering college in India. And when we reach out, we could not just 20K, we could maybe have a million dollar, sorry, million people <laughs> yeah, dollars. <laughs> a million people coming in India from the yep. So, uh, Ravi Pratap, who is uh, already involved in the Indian chapter community and already driving some of the initiative in the student chapter. So, currently, even he is in discussion with a few universities to be being on board with the student chapter society. So, welcome, Ravi. Thank you. Kamlesh. One more, one more call out with Ravi. So, I think. So he's an example, right? So how you all can be can be involved, and then how you can also start leading the opportunities. So Ravi was one of the mentee uh, at Hyperledger. <laughs> so he went through the process of starting from zero. He started contributing to projects. He became a mentee. He went through that phase, and now he is helping others drive the community and taking on leadership roles. So he's an he's an example of, of recent example that you all can refer. And Ravi can maybe talk about more in, in the next session that he's going to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he's definitely an inspiration. Yep. And you know, has quite a dynamic personality. Okay. Yeah. So next slide. And uh Pramod uh Mal, he's the he's the head of uh trans transmission of IT at uh, big FM, big FM is a radio broadcasting company. FM big FM radio and is a technology head there and he has a more than 35 years of experience and work with uh, global MNC companies like IBM, SRT, and VFS Global and he has been uh, uh, he he has been the hyperledger Mumbai and Pune chapter leads even before joining me and due to some other reasons he was stepped out uh, during that period in during COVID period but from last six months he is showing interest and he would like to take the lead and uh, uh, and he started again engaging with the Hyperledger India community or Hyperledger community via the Mumbai chapter and uh, involving the India in the chapter community. So, and he has a very good network uh, with the university because he has, he has been uh, part of the uh, tech community for the last 35 years. So, he's a good addition to the student chapter society to take to the next level. So, welcome to the team. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I look forward to contributing from my side. Yeah, and I think this uh, about this developer advocate because I I have, I'm watching other other blockchain community like Polygon like 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 R three and they have a separate segment for the developer advocate. So developer advocate the person is the ambassador or the technologies who could who could driver uh, you know kind of kind of uh, involve the developer communities and in India is the largest developer community in the world. So engaging all the developers who are building uh, some solution or some uh, as a, as a, uh, programming, we, we as a developer community should involve all the developers to be work on hyperledger projects, hyperledger uh, community or contribute to the hyperledger projects. And uh, adding the person like Kartike and Aditya and Nidhi because they are they are a developer face in the blockchain blockchain community face in the in the developer community. So adding all these three people in the in the this segment, they can drive and kind of motivate the developer developer out there to to be become a hyperledger hyperledger developer or contribute back to the hyperledger project and contributing to the open source project. We can we can take to the hyperledger foundation to the next level and 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 this is the this is the uh, my thought process to the developer advocate in the in the segment because other other open source community driving the open source community via the developer advocate. Uh, channel. So, and uh, so Kartike and uh, Aditya Joshi and uh, Nidhi is part of the developer advocate team to lead the specific uh, developer advocate uh, community in India. So, uh, about Kartike, Kartike is uh, part of the Hyperledger community and especially Hyperledger Hyderabad chapter. So, he is the leader for Hyperledger Hyderabad chapter and he is very uh, in engaging in the community and uh, even yesterday, he was part of the one university session. And every week, I have something he planned in the hyperledger chapter, uh, hyperledger chapter. And he's working with KPMG. KPMG is working with a couple of CBDC and uh, blockchain projects globally. And he's one of the senior consultants there. So, welcome to uh, 
in the chapter okay sir thank you looking forward thank you very much aditya so even aditya you no know, introduction required especially in the developer community so everyone uh, who learning the hyperledger fabric deployment on on kubernetes or as other kind of uh, uh, deployment is specific everyone follows his youtube channel his courses on udemy and even my team at my company also uses uh, his youtube videos and youtube uh, uh, open source uh, uh, github repository to deploying the production deployment so and i think i think it is a great addition to to this kind of person to the developer community to attract the developer out there to get involved in the blockchain community and uh, uh, so welcome aditya aditya is a part of our global tech team india and looking forward to it yeah so uh didi even didi i know from last 5 years so she has been earlier part of the geo geo platform geo is a uh geo platform is working on a and working on the stride blockchain and other uh, other blockchain implementation in the telecom industry and she has been one of the developer to those big uh, big hyperledger fabric projects and currently she is part of the uh walmart global tech india and she has been active in the community as a, as a contributor as a, as, a, as a participant she has been a winner in hyperlink 2021 and women in technology hackathon and uh, also the finalist for the npci hackathon recently which my company and npci conducted and uh, like aditya and uh, kartik she is also the uh, global face in the developer community so welcome to the team and looking forward to take to the india to the next level uh, maybe we can create a 50000 uh, developer community in the next one year so, yep 15 to 50 yeah. all right i'm i'm waiting i'll be waiting i'll, I'll be here to help you nithi and the rest of you yeah, thank you danny yeah so uh, congratulate everyone and looking forward to uh let's see how we can get uh, 15 15k to 50k in next one year and all the best so uh and you can involve uh, you can join our weekly meetings uh, every thursday and now we have a broader team and extended team we can plan and we'll hear out from everyone like what what can be done to take it 15 to 50k and what what other stuff we can do because as a now we have a 10 to 15 minds together So take the the different thought process and take this to next level. So and we will be needing help from Julian and Hyperledger Foundation and Daniela and uh, Arun uh, from the community to take this forward. And everyone out there, uh, the Hyperledger Fab, Babel maintainers, uh, Swaji, and so on, and the IBM research people, Rama, and I think many out there in Indian community who are working on blockchain projects, many startup community in India. So yeah, thank you and congratulate everyone. Vikram, over to you. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, I would, you know, uh, probably say thank you to everyone for, you know, uh, especially, you know, Daniela and you know Julian for, you know, putting the trust in me. And so we'll definitely, you know, take, you know, take your vision of, you know, increasing this community. And we'll definitely, you know, aim for fifty thousand. Let's see, you know, where we reach out by the end of, you know, this year, right? When the next time we meet at Hyper Ledger Connect. so uh, we'll definitely take it forward and i you know look forward to working with this extended team right uh, working you know i've been working with arun and kamlesh for last 3 4 years now you know i got hooked with you know when we start the hyper hack 2020 you know i got hooked with that and uh, since then i you know i'm trying to you know contribute and you know we'll continue doing so with the with this whole team and i'm definitely sure that these are all the champions that you know we needed to you know make this in you know, a community a success yeah looking forward to working with you all so uh, uh, we can hear so, out from your individual uh, if dipika want to address something or ritu uh, nidhi ravi samu anyone yeah definitely um so i mean i started exploring blockchain with a simple hackathon just for the fun of it um and from there you know my journey started with writing blogs and then of course i got involved with hyperledger i wasn't even in the blockchain team and uh, i incidentally met arun in 
like one of those hackathons that he was also part competing against me and um i converted him into my mentor which is a very cool story but um that's where the kind you know blockchain journey kind of started and um to see you know that kind of growth from feb or jan of last year to seven march of this year it's been a really really crazy journey and i'm very very excited to be working with all of you i have worked with kamlesh i have um, you know been up all the hypothetical and see kind of that bring in the kind of discussions ideas that we have i was also part of the uh, hypothetical challenge where a lot of firms across the world presented really really cool ideas so to be involved in the kind of community where everyone is trying to help each other and um, build projects together um it really excites me and um i'm sure we have a really great team and i have really big shoes to fill like i was just telling people earlier um arun's impact is been huge and um i hope i can do justice to this role and i'm really looking forward to working with everyone sure ba uh, i uh, thanks deepika i think you know uh, in the interest of time i would recommend that you know we start with the the next presentation that we have you know so ravi as as a mentee you know wanted to share his experiences so we had planned for that so in the interest of time you know we are already running behind time so i would request that uh, so shall we go ahead with this uh, with the presentations yeah i think uh, we can go okay so uh, ravi uh, uh, so pro- i'll you know hand over to you to share your experiences as a mentee that you know how you felt you know uh, how you started your journey how you felt and you know how have you reached you know this place where you know uh, you are you know engaging more and more people in you know getting them you know into our community yeah sure <clears throat> so shall i screen uh, share my sure, screen sure sure please go ahead okay just click one second So is it visible? Not yet. Vikram? Not yet. Not yet. Not it. Not not yet. Okay. Now Yep uh, now we can see your screen okay yes so ha- hello everyone i am ravi patap singh so today i am uh, about to share some of my experience during last mentorship session in hyper laser foundation which i finished in this december this year so uh, i will be talking something about how it uh, started with me regarding thinking about mentorship i'm doing the mentorship and what i am doing at the end of this mentorship so i'll i'll make uh, the presentation quick short because even uh, i have been allotted 15 minutes time but i will try to finish in 10 minutes so when i look back at open source software ecosystem so in this ecosystem actually there are so many participants participants but the basic idea is around a central entity that is developer and every every time if community wanted to grow from current knowledge knowledge base to the extended one so it needs some more participation from uh, developer because they are the core in this ecosystem so when any particular individual who is wanted to be a, a prospective developer if he is he or she is in college so around at the end of third or fourth year she start thinking that okay how to start contributing the open source community or project even though she or he has many questions like uh, do i know good enough will i be just by the community or how do i fit myself in the overall objective of the community at at such to fulfill this gap or to uh, make it more engaging the hyperledger foundation has mentorship uh, uh, let's say a scholarship or session which consist kind of a one to one interpersonal relationship between a mentor who is already experienced uh, 
contributor in the open source community and an ex inexperienced mentee. And what it does that during the mentorship, what I experienced that it's kind of structured hands-on learning opportunity. And you can work remotely, you get paid well, I mean, as per Indian standard, and you get regular feedback from your mentor. You have you have kind of opportunity to travel also during the mentorship session if there is any opportunity kind of conference or face-to-face -face meetup, et cetera. And on that line, the Happy Leisure Foundation support the mentees to achieve that object objective. So how it started for me? So basically, I mean, mentorship has standard three-way approach that every year, there are so many projects. So you see the projects and you are eligible to apply maximum three projects in a particular uh, call. So I replied for three calls, then based on your application or whatever information you put or a skill set you have demonstrated, you will be shortlisted for the interview. And I mean, what I applied for three projects. So I got an uh, interview call for, from two projects actually, but it was fortunate enough that I got um, an opportunity with uh, one of mentored in Europe regarding uh, this SLA development. So this is about how you bought it. Once you bought it, then during the mentorship, it was the first call with mentors. So basically we started uh, having casual conversation. Okay, from where to start? What are the resources? What is your skill set? and uh, how much time you can contribute. And here I wanted to mention that even though this high mentorship program is very structured, but it is flexible also, because initially I thought that I'll finish in three months full-time, but some or other way I had some uh, time issue, timing issues. So I requested the uh, project manager that, okay, I wanted to make it half time. Is it possible? So uh, including my mentor recommended that, yes, we can move it from full time to half time kind of so on that on that line we set up everything what are the expectation how we can communicate communicate how we can communicate with the community and uh, I mean, how to go forward so we actually we we make a project plan kind of then on that project plan our the technical aspects were i will try to finish in just three minutes the technical aspects that we wanted to develop a sla agreement tool or just a test case and a specific test case was that there are so many uh, like example service providers especially in cloud so uh, but there is always two party one is user one is the service provider so in between these two parties there are some kind of agreements is it possible to have that agreement inside the blockchain space so that we can have uh, transparency and uh, accountability in the both both parties so what we we were trying to do that we wanted to interface the existing hyperledger fabric with FPC fabric uh, private chain code. Uh, we choose explicitly the FPC because it uh, shows it shows a root root or a solution that okay in traditional approaches every participant is able to access the information but we do not want to disclose this all this information so we opted. That, okay, we will try to uh, link the Happy Leisure uh, Fabric private chain code with our implementation. So this was kind of scheme. And during mentorship, actually, we did deliver, deliver something that there was really three spaces that we wanted to set up standard fabric network. And then is it possible to have a GUI from administrative point of view, admin point of view? So we integrated that with the Happy Leisure Explorer. And uh, test our use case with uh, SLA contract. So we were able to, I would not say that we were able to succeed at 100%, but yes, close to 60 plus percentage. So, I mean, the, if somebody wanted to explore, then uh, PPT and a video demonstration and product repository is mentioned here, kind of. During this, as I mentioned that a global, sorry, the Hyperledger Foundation during mentorship, especially for mentors, if you wanted to explore our other events like face-to-face -face meetup uh, with the community, or you wanted to participate in any conference, then you can apply for Hyperledger uh, Foundation travel, travel scholarships. I applied for it and 
uh, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship. So it was kind of, you get travel expenses, accommodation expansion and in-person registration fees. So it's kind of a good opportunity for me. And apart from the, if somebody did not qualify or did not had a scholarship at the end, even though she, uh, he or she have got a complimentary access to the Global Forum live sessions, especially for uh, mentees in 2022. So what I did that it was kind of, let's say, I wanted to meet my mentor. So there I met mentor, I met the community project, uh, let's say contributor and uh, maintainers. And it was really fun having, exploring uh, people from different places, even though I have been uh, to Europe for last four or five years, but meeting them after this COVID, after two and a half years, it was really exciting and fun. So it's good. And one specific incident that even though we are talking about open source, but what happened that during this event, we wanted to travel certain places. So we planned, me especially, Vikram, we planned to visit a, visit a place or some other way. I mean, that plan did not work out. So actually we were standing on across the road and there were few people also, they were having same similar plan. I don't know what happened, but uh, it just, just, just like community, we interacted with them and within 10 minutes, we had a plan that, okay, we will, if there is no public transport, we are unable to uh, go through as per plan, then we can have a, let, what they say, contingency plan. So on the spot, we interacted with them. We had make up a full plan and within half an hour, we, we uh, proceed. So it was also kind of a life skill experience for me as well. After the mentorship, because initially I started, uh, applied, got mentorship, did some technical works, but uh, this is not only about technical uh, works. There are so many things which you can do after the mentorship, like after mentorship, I am, trying to get involved in Happy Laser India chapter I mean, because I had, um, I wanted to contribute on that day. And I'm also trying to contribute to Happy Laser Blockchain Explorer Lab. And of course the Fabric private chain code. And we were trying to, we are trying to put some project proposal uh, for extension of, um, I wanted to extend whatever I did in the last mentorship sessions. So this is uh, something really exciting and what I did learn during the mentorship and the special thing is that I get to know the process, especially in open source project, how to start, what are the pitfalls and what are the nitty gritties, what you have to do, what is the standard process. There are so many things which are um, especially designed in the for open source community. So it's kind of process of self-learning and how you can continuously improve and make your contribution visible in the open source community. So at last, I would like to say that if somebody, somebody or, uh, I mean, not only the college is student, but if somebody is on the kind of a different track, he wanted to get involved in the hyperledger or any in general open source project, then mentor sessions are really helpful for them to open or break that barrier and have a one-to-one, -one, it starts from one-to-one -one engagement. And once you are inside the community, then, your responsibility shifts from uh, being trainee to help other to get inside the community. So on that line, I'm uh, currently engaging in the um, student chapter, student society engagement. And I would like to work with the I mean, India chapter team and make sure that my contribution count in the community. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ravi. And definitely, you know, Hyperledger, you know, you know uh, Hyperledger forums and, you know, the meetups, they definitely bring the community together and, you know, give them chance to explore and, you know, new ways of, you know, looking at blockchain and new ways of connecting, right? So thank you, Hyperledger, for, you know, organizing such, you know, great events and, you know, uh, getting us, you know, a chance to be together. You know, I also was, you know, have been working with Arun Kamlesh, you know, for few, you know, for many years now, right? But uh, High Pleasure Global Forum was the first point when we all met. Yeah. So yes. same way, and I met Ravi as well there. Right. 
so yeah so thank you ravi thanks a lot for you know sharing your experiences and we definitely understand that you know hyperledger mentorship is a you know great program you know uh, where you know where one gets to experiment with blockchain and you know also the mentees who get to learn new things and you know contribute to the community right and that too you know uh, this is a paid exercise that they got so thank you thanks a lot you know hyperledger foundation for such great opportunities for you know the upcoming for the you know the students and you know others who are trying to adopt blockchain with that you know i would uh, move to aditya so aditya again you know is a known face and he is our developer advocate and now you know uh, he is going to present how we can leverage you know pluggable ca with hyperledger fabric and it's a known problem you know for anyone who is trying to implement blockchain and you know hyperledger fabric that you know how do i manage my certificates how do i rotate the keys so with that you know without you know further ado you know handing over to aditya to go over you know how we can you know uh, do you know this you know brilliant stuff adding to adding to what vikram just said right so we are actually moving from one mentee to another mentee so aditya was also one of the mentee at hyperledger foundation and it's yeah. great to see you uh, contribute back right thanks sir. aditya thanks sir okay uh, so for the presentation i'll move to my screen uh, so please let me know if it is uh, visible to you guys thank you okay uh, so uh, this session is about how we can leverage or how we can add pluggable or custom cas with the fabric uh, blockchain and this is a known problem in the industry like uh, right now fabric uh, when you go and look at the various example present on the internet about like using certificate authority you will find uh, either fabric ca or crypto gen for generating those identities but there is a bigger problem when you know well established organizations they have their own certificate authorities which they might be using for from years and now they want to use that same certificate authorities to issue identities to the fabric nodes or the users of the fabric uh, blockchain and bootstrap those networks so uh, before uh, jumping into the presentation uh, i would like to introduce myself i am aditya I am a software engineer at Walmart and also an instructor at Udemy. I'm an open source enthusiast and uh, contributing and maintaining some of the projects at the Hyperledger Foundation. Now, uh, let's talk about some of the uh, features of the fabric before actually jumping into the problem statement. So we know that fabric uh, is quite flexible in terms of uh, some of the concepts that it brings, like the one of the important or uh, extension that it provides is the pluggability. You it allows you to plug uh, multiple uh, consensus algorithm. You can uh, basically uh, bootstrap the network at uh, uh, at different different places like, uh, or different different infrastructures. And uh, these are some of the features that I have listed here. Like it supports. Uh, you know, transactions at on uh, permissioning, like who can endorse the transactions, who can be the part of the transactions. You it also support richer queries with the help of state database. So it also provides a pluggability where you can attach the CouchDB as a state database, and you can do flexible or rich queries on the top of that uh, database. Now, one more key feature that uh, it provides is supporting from uh, for bring your own identity. Like it provides you uh, a feature where you can provide or bootstrap the networks using your own identities or your your custom identities. And these identities can be coming from any source. Uh, you can use either Fabric CA, you can use CryptoGen, you can use uh, well-established your organization level certificate authorities, you can use uh, uh, OpenSSL for issuing of the certificates. You can use um, any kind of certificate authority because at the end of the day, the Fabric nodes or the Fabric components require the certificates which can be verified and uh, which are in the required format to uh, establish or to run the network. Now, uh, fabric in uh, to run the fabric uh, nodes, we need two kind of certificates. Uh, so, first is the enrollment certificate, uh, which is used for signing up the transactions, which uh, needs to be there whenever you are signing up the transaction. And second type of certificate that is needed, which is the TLS certificate, which is used for setting up the TLS communication amongst the node. So uh, when we talk about enrollment certificates, 
we need to uh, there are there are multiple roles or multiple components in the fabric network for them we need the these enrollment certificates so a uh, few of the roles are like admin uh, is one of the role then peer is one of the component orderer and client and these all need certificates to run the node or to sign the transaction so uh, admin ad, ad, admin need the those certificates those enrollment certificates to make change to the network let's say there is some uh, update that you want to make to the ch uh, channel then or to the network then you will be needing the admin certificate let's say there is a peer node so peer node it in, in itself needs some certificates to bootstrap itself and similarly for order as well we need those certificates to bootstrap them and or in order to you know sign the transactions and send those blocks to the uh, uh, to the peer nodes so and when we talk about the tls certificate so we have uh, majorly two uh, a primary usage for tls certificate so one is the you know uh, end to end uh, encryption or uh, tls communication amongst the nodes clients like all the components that are there in the fabric uh, network and second one is like uh, when you want to have the communication to the channel then at the time as well you need the valid tls certificates and uh, these valid certificates are are provision or not not in the provision but managed by something called msp so uh, i have seen like people getting very confused with the msp like what msp is uh, most of them think uh, that it's a service that is running onto the blockchain or uh, running into the pa node but it's actually not any kind of a service it's not a program or not a process or not a worker which is running inside your nodes and man, uh, maintaining or ensuring the memberships of the node again it's not a provider it's not any kind of provider like oauth or ldap that will issue up the certificates for you it's uh, it's just a naming convention that is given and apart from that um, apart from the naming it doesn't have anything significance to do with the what exactly it means uh, but there is uh, one important thing or what then then what exactly msp is so uh, msp is nothing but it is just a set of folder structures that needs to be there uh, in order to bootstrap your network and uh, remember like uh, when i when i say uh, the structure uh, i literally mean that you need to follow the right structure that we'll see uh, in some of the upcoming slides uh, but uh, before jumping into that uh, i want to talk more on the uh, types of msps that are there in the fabric network so we have local msps or you might find them in your local file systems whenever you bootstrap the network whenever you generate the certificates you will see them in your local file system like you will see the folders getting created and you will see all the certificates present into those uh, folders and every node must have a its local msp defined uh, whether it is a pa node or an ordering node it is uh, required for them to have a valid msp uh, setup the second type of msp is the channel msp and in case of channel msps the certificates or the details are present in the channel uh, configuration and all the organization or all the nodes who are participating in, or who are joining the channel their their or their their msps or their certificate must be present in the channel in order to function okay so remember i talked about the structure uh, about the msp structure or msp is just a set of directories and uh, when i said like uh, the structure so structure does matter you cannot escape or you cannot change the structure of uh, the msp directories or the folders that are needed to uh, uh, set up the msps so uh, this is how uh, your local msp structure looks like uh, you will see a bunch of folders getting created inside the msp uh, folder yeah and uh, you uh, so you will see a bunch of folders like ca certificate where your uh, certificate of the ca would be present then you will have key stores and the sign cert where you will be storing up the public key and the private key for that particular uh, identity uh, and then you will see the tls ca certificate where you have to provide the tls certificate uh, of the certificate authority and then you will see bunch of uh, other folders if you are using intermediate certificate authorities or if you are using chainings then you have to provide those certificates in the respective directory but uh, in case of 
channel uh, MSP, the structure is kind of different because all those certificates or identities should be present at the channel level. So uh, here I have decoded one of the channel or one of the block from the channel and uh, I have highlighted the MSP part. So uh, here in the in this white block, you can see that I have highlighted uh, two uh, organizations and their MSPs and inside these uh the, in, inside this json structure you will see the certificate or for this particular organization uh who is the part of this particular channel okay uh so uh now uh i like to talk about the uh, uh utility tool that we'll use in today's demo to uh generate or to issue the uh, certificates and uh, in your case, it can be any kind of a tool which supports uh, some of the prerequisites that are there for the fabric uh, nodes to uh, accept those certificates. And in today's uh, session, we will be using the, the tool CFSSL, which is a complete PKI uh, provided by the Cloudflare team. Uh, they, are, they, they were using this uh, utility tool for a quite long in their uh, 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 in their in, the, in their internal projects for issuing up the certificates and managing them, and uh, I have listed some of the features for uh, that is provided by the CEF SSL tool. Uh, it's a, it's an entire PKI tool, so you will live, you will get all the features that are provided by the PKI, like the certificate rotation, the uh, certificate uh, uh, renewal, all those features you can uh, you can find with this tool. It also support RSA and ECDSA uh, algorithms. So Fabric nodes need, uh, uh, they accept the certificate which are generated using the ECDSA algorithm. And uh, if you try to provide the RSA signed or RSA based uh, certificates, uh, then uh, Fabric nodes will not be able to understand them and they will never be uh, get bootstrapped. Uh, this tool also provides database integration. So just like if you have ever used Fabric CA, you might have seen that Fabric CA also provide some of the database integration, like you can use Postgres, you can use MySQL, and uh, by the default implementation that it gives is for the SQLite. Uh, similarly, for CF SSL as well, you can use uh, uh, you, you can use external databases, and then your certificates that are issued to you they will be stored into those uh, databases. And this tool can run in CLI and as well as server mode. And uh, what I meant by CLI and the server mode is you can uh, so this the, the CFSL binary can be run in a standalone mode where you don't need to run it in a server mode. And uh, if you try to run the server, the CFSL binary in the server mode, then you can uh, leverage the REST APIs that are provided along with the CFSL tool. And you can use this tool uh, or integrate this tool along with your workflows where you want to generate the identities on the runtime and uh, maybe you want to do some transactions or any kind of action that you want to take on the network using those identities. So for today's demo, uh, I want to highlight uh, how the structure will look like or how the components will look like when you go with the Fabric CA. Uh, so uh, for this, today's demo, we will be having three organization and uh, we will have two peer organization and one ordering organization. Uh, which is org1 and org2, these are the peer organization. And then we have one order organization, which is going to have one order. And all these three organizations will be issuing up the certificates or they will be getting up the certificate from the Fabric CA. And this is how the typical workflow looks like when you go with the Fabric CA. Uh, you ask the identities from the Fabric CA and you provide those entities to the nodes and, uh, 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 and to, the, uh, to the organization, and then you bootstrap the network. So the flow will be exactly similar when you go with the CF SSL. Uh, again, this time as well, you will be using the CF SSL tool. Uh, either it might be running in the server mode or you might be running in the CLI mode and you will be getting up the certificate and the nodes will be bootstrapped using those certificates. Uh, one thing to re remember is that uh, uh, at the end of the day, the expectation of the, these peer nodes and ordering nodes is to have the valid certificates. And it doesn't matter like from where you are getting the certificate. Uh, if you are able to set up the proper uh, uh, memberships among those certificates or, or proper chain or establishment among those certificates, then you are good to go and you can bootstrap the node, your network using, uh, uh, using those uh, certificates. 
So uh, in today's demo, we will have all the organizations running in a single system, uh, in, a, in a single machine. We will have two organizations and each of the organization will have one peer and one CF SSL as the certificate authority. We'll have one order uh, that will be having its own organization, uh, which is order org. And all the components are uh, going to be running in Docker container. So the entire application is containerized. Okay, so uh, now let's talk about the process, like what is exactly the process that uh, you need to follow when you are uh, using any certificate authority for your network to bootstrap. So the very first thing is you need to have the valid server, uh, valid CA server key pair. You need to have the valid uh, uh, signing certificate and the, uh, from the CA uh, itself. Then uh, you need to issue the signing certificates. And remember when you are using, or when you, whenever you are issuing of the signing certificate, you have to provide the signing profiles. Now, what I meant by signing profiles is, uh, uh, so your certificate should contain the details that it is, it is meant to be for the signing, not for any other purpose. And uh, when you want to issue the TLS certificate, then you have to use the TLS profile, uh, which uh, uh, you, you will be able to see whenever you will to open SSLD, uh, you know, decode on those certificate and you will be able to see that whether this certificate is meant for signing purpose or whether it is meant for TLS uh, handshake purpose. And uh, the one of the important requirements from the fabric uh, nodes is that uh, it supports only ECDSA algorithm. So your certificate must be uh, generated using the ECDSA algorithm. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll wait for some questions. If there is any question, then probably we can jump on to the demo. Okay, uh, enough talking. I think now we can uh, directly jump into the implementation, how uh, I, exactly uh, implemented uh, these things. Okay, uh, let me close my presentation. Okay, uh, so hope this screen is visible to you and the font is readable to uh, everyone. Uh, if needed, I can just increase the font size. Yeah, it's okay, then you can go ahead. Okay, okay. so uh, what I have done for uh, this implementation is I have I, I am maintaining a repository of fabric samples advanced uh, uh, topics. And uh, uh, for this implementation, I had made minimal uh, changes uh, and I wanted to make it uh, happen like that, uh, like having minimal changes, not modifying much of the existing workflows uh, or existing scripts and uh, to get the things going on. So uh, before uh, actually, uh, you know, seeing the demo, I just want to make you a walk through the, uh, the changes that I have made uh, in order to uh, uh, use this CFSSL as your certificate authority. So this is the existing uh, uh, fabric, this is coming from the fabric samples repo. And uh, I have added one more flag here. Like uh, if you pass, whenever you are bootstrapping the network, if you pass this flag CFSSL, then it will start using the CFSSL binary to bootstrap your uh, or to generate the certificates. This is the first change that I have made. Then I have made change at uh, uh, at the network uh, up phase where yeah. So uh, when we are actually creating up the certificates, uh, either. Uh, uh, earlier, this script used to support only cryptogen and certain authority like the fabric seed, but I have added one more flag here, which is uh, which will be triggered when you pass the hyphen CFSSL as the flag when you bootstrap the network. I am sourced. I am just you know loading one script. I have created a script and uh, and that script is present in this CFSSL folder. And here I am calling some bunch of functions from that uh, script to issue up the identity. So these are uh, the functions that are present in the in that script, in this register and enroll script. And uh, so here I'm trying to uh, get the certificate for the 
uh, this particular identity, uh, which is peer zero of org one dot example dot com, and then uh, this is the org name, and then in the next line, I am trying to create the identity for the admin. Uh, again, uh, I have given the cert type as admin. So here you can see I have written the uh, definition or what these parameters are used for. So the first parameter is the cert type. The second parameter is the common name, like for which you want to issue the identity. And the third is the org name. Similar, you can see here the cert type is either peer or admin uh, for the for this particular function. The common name is this. Like in, in this case, I want to issue up the certificate for uh, peer zero dot example dot com, and this is the org like org one and org two. The uh, same goes for here as well. Like uh, I'm just changing out the common names and just flipping the organization so that I can get the certificate for this particular uh, node as well. Then I'm issuing up the certificate for ordering node as well. And uh, since I have only one ordering organization, so the third parameter which was supposed to be order that is already present in the script. Uh, so in this case, you need to provide only two parameters like the cert type, and then you need to provide the common name for which you want to issue up the certificates. So for ordering org as well, I am issuing up two certificates. One is itself for the order, and second it is for the admin, uh, uh, which we will using for uh, doing any kind of a transactions. Now uh, I was talking about the script, uh, uh, which is actually doing all these uh, things. And uh, if I go to this organization directory, and uh, so previously there were uh, these two folders like Cryptogen and Fabric CA. And they have their uh, required set of files which were needed to generate the certificate uh, using these uh, two tools. But uh, what I have done is I have added one more uh, folder here, which is CFSSL. And inside this CFSSL, uh, you can see my script, uh, which is register and enroll dot sh. And this is the script where I am issuing up the certificates from uh, uh, from uh, from the CFSL binary. So you can see that function that I was calling in network.sh script. Uh, these are listed here, and these are the internal function uh, that are used by uh, these scripts. Uh, let me show you how exactly the search generation happens. Is so uh, uh, remember if you remember, like uh, I was emphasizing on the directory structure of the uh, MSPs, and that is very much needed. So here I'm trying to create the directory structure. Uh, first, I'm trying to set up the proper directory structure, whatever is needed. I'm just looping on the these directories and creating the required set of folders. After that, uh, I have created some of the templates uh, which are needed uh, when you, uh, which are basically the CSRs or certificate signing request uh, that will basically hold the information like how or what all details should be present in your certificate. I'll come to those scripts or those uh, those those files. And what essentially I'm also doing is uh, before running the script, I'm making sure if my CA identity is issued for this uh, particular org or not. And I'm doing by this, I'm doing just by a check. Like I'm doing a check here. And if the if the CA keys is already present, uh, then I'm moving with ahead with the creation of identities for the required uh, components. But if it is not, then I'm generating the uh, CS certificate itself. So here you can see I am using the CFSL binary and I'm doing the init CA, which will going to give me the CA certificate for uh, whatever information I'm providing. And I'm I'm I'm, I'm using some of the template files to uh, to issue up the identities. Uh, let's go and see some of the template files. So this is one of the template file, which is ca hyphen peer dot json, and this is the template file which uh, is used for bootstrapping or uh, issuing of the certificate for the ca itself so whenever we our ca will be bootstrapped for 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 the peer organization it should have all these details and remember like i told that fabric support only ecdsc algorithm uh, so i am explicitly providing the ecdsc algorithm but if you not pass then uh, by default this tool assumes that the algorithm is uh, rsa in the case i am providing some bunch of uh, so these are nothing these are the uh, identifier or the subjects that you see on the certificates and these are uh, the hosts that you can provide like for which this certificate uh, is going to be issued similarly uh, i have one more file which is for the ordering node or uh, you can call it as the ca for ordering organization uh, it's pretty much similar the same similar details just i'm changing the 
common name here for the differentiation. Uh, now, uh, there is uh, one more uh, important file uh, that I want to highlight is, uh, if you remember in my presentation, I was talking about the profiles, like the signing profile uh, you or the TLS profile that you need to provide whenever you are issuing the certificate. And uh, if you have ever tried to decode the certificate that are issued by Fabric C or you know, uh, Cryptogen, you will see that it, it contains some identifiers or some details that makes it uh, easily differentiable that it is a TLS certificate or is it a signing certificate. So similarly, I have added uh, two profiles here. This is uh, one of the uh, uh, default parameters that I have set for the profile. And here you can see I have two profiles defined. Like one is the signing profile and second one is the TLS profile. And in the signing profile, this is this was the part which I was you know emphasizing like uh, what should be present in the certificate to make it differentiable whether it is a signing certificate or is it a TLS certificate. So in case of signing certificate, you need to provide these set of uses like how this certificate can be used. And I'm additionally passing the uh, expiry uh, here, uh, like uh, whatever certificate will be issued with this profile, this will have the expiry F uh, as this much number of hours. For TLS profile, uh, again, uh, the usage is much more important. And here you can see that I am using, uh, uh, in the usage section, I'm using uh, server auth and client auth, which means that these certificates are meant for the TLS communication. And you will be able to see that they are used for the TLS or you will see the TLS identifier in those certificates whenever uh, you will try to decode those certificates. So this is the profile that uh, I'm using uh, while uh, generating of the certificate. Then I have a bunch of some CSRs uh, created for a specific type of certificate that I want to issue. Like so, this this CR if, this CSR if you see this is the for issuing of the admin certificate, uh, and I have set the OU as admin, and uh, uh, you can see that I am passing some of the template variables here, and these values will be replaced on the runtime since it's a template. I want to reuse this template uh, for every other certificate that I am creating for admin. So that's why I have uh, passed the templates here and uh, these the values will be substituted here on the runtime. Uh, let's see the order certificate as well. So it's pretty much same. The only difference is uh, I am passing the OU or the organization unit here as uh, order. And in case of peer, uh, you might see that the OU is peer, but the rest of the things are uh, pretty much same. And uh, if I show you the search generation process, since I'm running this uh, in the in the CLI mode, so uh, you might see me running uh, commands from the CLI, uh, something like this, something like this, uh, where I'm generating of the certificate. And uh, here I have to pass the root CA certificate uh, for this part whenever I'm using the certificate. I'm also passing the key and I'm also passing the configuration like, and this is the same configuration where I would define the profiles, uh, the signing profiles. Then I have to give the common name. I have to give the host. And this is the profile that I was talking about. So this profile is present in this signing, in this file, which is search signing hyphen config.json. And you need to provide the required profile whenever you are generating up the certificate. So here you can see I'm using the TLS as a profile, but somewhere in uh, above section, you might see me using at the signing profile. So here you can see that first I generate up the certificate for the signing purpose or the enrollment certificate. And next and uh, and uh, next time I was generating up the certificate for uh, for the TLS purpose. And uh, for every node or for every component, I'm generating both the signing certificate and the TLS certificate. And that you can see uh, in the in these functions. Uh, Right. Uh, so now uh, I can I can show you the demo. Uh, so I can just quickly run the couple of scripts, uh, and we should be good to go uh, with them. So uh, I'll show you. Uh, let me move to the required directory, uh, which is test network, and uh, uh, I'll can let me see. Uh, okay. Now let's try to see what all options comes with this network.sh script. So uh, I have added uh, one example here. So earlier there were examples for using, you know, uh, uh, Fabric CA as the 
30 authority. So if you see this example command, if you pass the hyphen CA flag, then it is supposed to be using fabric CA for bootstrapping or generating of your entities. But in but in, in my case, I'll be using uh, CF SSL. So I'll be passing this kind of flag when I'm bootstrapping or when I'm generating the certificate. So I'll quickly generate the certificates and uh, I'm passing the my CF SSL flag. So this should generate the CF SSL uh, uh, issued certificate. And one more thing to uh, remember is like I have already installed the CF SSL uh, binaries in my system. And I have added those details like how you can install them uh, in the readme. So if you, if I show you that snippet here, so you can see uh, I am, I have basically added command like how you can install in the Linux and how you can install them in the Mac OS, like the CFSL binary. So now I already have the binary. What I'll do, I'll just simply run the script. Wait, I think started easy. Let me just do it. I think I was passing, there was some typo here. So uh, uh, when I pass the uh, CFSSL as my uh, flag, so you can see uh, I am getting the certificate generate here. So these are my certificate is getting generated. So first it uh, generated the identities for the org one, and then it generated the identities for the org two. Uh, it tried to generate the identities like for uh, all the components or whatever we have defined in the script. And then it generated the identities for the orderer uh, organization. And then it started uh, uh, all the three nodes. Like we had two peers and one ordering node. So it started all the components. And uh, now let's try to see whether the certs were actually generated or not. So the certs were supposed to be generated in this uh, in this directory inside test network. We have this organization directory. And inside organization, we have order organization and uh, peer organization as well. So I think, yeah, cool. We can see some of the certificates that are generated here. And similarly, for, for both like order and peer organization. And uh, we can see the certificate. Let's try to uh, uh, decode the certificate uh, for uh, this particular, uh, th this particular, let's try to decode this separate particular certificate. So I'll do open SSL. Uh, Hope OpenSL is installed in this machine. And let's do text. Yep, so OpenSL installed. And you can see that this was the uh, issuer for the certificate. And uh, since it was a CA certificate, so the issuer and the subjects were supposed to be same in this case. Uh, you can see that this was the information that I provided uh in my in my csr file for this but for the peer ca and uh, you can see like the uh, expiry time like whatever expiry time was this is the default expiry time that is coming uh i have not explicitly configured the expiry time so by default it's like five 
um, years of expiry time. And you can see that the key that the algorithm that was used for uh, for this particular certificate is EC uh, uh, ECDS algorithm, which is a 256 bit algorithm. And uh, you can see that this is a signing certificate. So whatever uh, uh, details uh, you will uh, you will you, you can see the usage here. Like this certificate can be used for only signing purpose, and you can see the uh, certificate itself uh, here. Uh, let's similarly do a uh, TLS certificate as well. And for the TLS, let's try to do the TLS certificate for uh, uh, peer node. So I'll go to the peer. I'll I'll go to the uh, this TLS folder, and here you can see that we have the CA certificate. Uh, TLS CS certificate and I have the server.crt which is the certificate TLS certificate for this peer which is peerd0.org1.example.com. I'll copy the path. Let's do open SSL again. And let's get the text out of it. So uh, this time uh, you can see so you can see uh, the signature algorithm, uh, which is fine. You can see the issue, like who issued this identity. So this issued was, the certificate was issued by this particular uh, CA, which has uh, this particular common name. Then the certificate was issued to uh, this particular identity or this particular user. So in, in this case, it is peer0.example.com. And then I have given some bunch of identifiers, like uh, some country as India, state as Delhi, and then location as Aero City. Uh, uh, and you can see uh, that this is an TLS certificate. Uh, you can see that the identifier uh, that we or the usage that we provided in the in the in the CSR that is present here, and uh, which means that it can be used for signing. It can be used for TLS communication. And these are some of the uh, uh, subject alternative or SANS that I provided uh, uh, in in my in my uh, in my CSR file. Uh, that has these properties like localhost and uh, IP address as 127.0.0.1. Okay, uh, I think cool. Uh, we were able to successfully generate the certificate. Let's see if our nodes are actually you know running fine with these certificates or not. They're happy with these certificates or not. So I will do Docker logs since these are you know running inside the container. I'll do Docker logs and uh, let's see the logs of peer peer zero of org one. Okay, so I'm not tailing up the logs here, uh, just to make it uh, less cumbersome. So uh, we can see that the certificate are uh, loaded here successfully. We can see uh, this was, I think, uh, if you if you remember the uh, the cert ex, uh, uh, decode that I just did, uh, it was having this as your expiry date, and uh, you can see that certs were loaded. Uh, we don't see any errors here. Uh, the node is quite happy with the certificate. And right now, since we have not created any channel, so this node says that there is no active channel. And all the system level chain codes were also loaded uh, in this node, like the LSCC and CSCC and QSCC. All these chain codes were loaded successfully. Uh, let's see the ordering uh, uh, logs as well, like the no logs from ordering node. So I think it is orderer. Yeah. So uh, this node is also looking fine. I mean, I don't see any. Uh, error sign here. Uh, certificates are loaded successfully, and uh, the nodes are pretty much happy with that. Now let's try to create a channel, and I'll create a channel. Uh, I'll call it as uh, let's call it as test channel. Okay, so uh, so we created a channel, and what happened is uh, order also joined the channel. We can see, or, or and by the way, like order is using the channel participation API. So this is what running on version two dot four, uh, which supports channel participation API. So I'm using channel participation API for order to join the channel. We can see that the channel, that the join was successful, and we can see that it was that the it, order joined as a consenter uh, in the chain. Uh, we can also see that uh, we are trying to join the channel for uh, first organization or the first node, which is org Z, which is PL0 coming from org1. It also joined successfully. And then the uh, second peer, which was from org2, also joined the channel. 
then we were doing a anchor peer update and uh, anchor peer update was also successful uh, i'll not go on to the logs detail here uh, just showing up the result like the anchor peer updates was also successful and now let's try to set up our cli so what i'll do is i have to set some environment variables so that uh, so that i can access the peer cli and make some transactions so uh, i have exported some of the environment variable now i can do set global which is uh, which is nothing just a function coming from one of the scripts and uh, basically this function will help me in setting up the environment variable so i'm setting up the environment variable for org1 and uh, now uh, all the environments variable that i needed for doing up the transaction uh, they are properly configured if i do peer channel list so uh, i should be able to see the channels that are there in the uh, that this peer has joined and i'm talking about the peer 0 of org1 because i have set the this uh, uh, flags for first organization so we can see that uh, channel join was successful and our cli is also working fine which means that cli is also using those certificates that were issued by the cfsl like the tls certificate and the signing certificate and uh, let's try to see how many blocks we have so i can do peer channel get info and i want to see information on my test channel and uh, if i run this command uh, i should see the height of the uh, uh, block or the height of the chain so right now we uh, it, we have only three blocks and these you can see the current hash and the previous hash of the latest block uh, so these things uh, are working fine let's try to do one more thing uh, let's try to basically install the chain code and uh, let's try to see if we are able to you know invoke the chain code with the help of these new certificates that are issued by the cfsf so i have okay i'll i'll just quickly run the help command again and uh, for the demonstration i'm using to install a javascript chain code uh, which is an asset transfer chain code which has uh, four functions i guess which are for creating a pi asset and then transferring the ownership of asset and reading the uh, uh, properties from the code, from the database so i'll deploy the chain code the ccn flag is the chain code name i'm giving the chain code name as basic the ccp is the chain code path so the chain code is present at this particular location and the language on this which chain code is written is javascript i have to pass the channel name as well uh, because right because the default channel that this script assume is the my channel and we have created a channel with name uh, test channel so i'll pass the test channel and uh, this should ideally install the chain code on all on both the peers so right now it's trying to do the packaging and installing of the chain code so it packaged the chain code successfully here you can see uh, it carried the package id and uh, the chain code was packaged then it will now try to install the chain code on the first peer and then similarly it will do it on the second peer then it will go for the approval phase the chain code approval phase and then finally the commit fail commit phase will happen and once the commit phase is uh, successful we can uh, use the chain code. Chain code is ready for use. And the source code is uh, uh, is present on the, my on my Git repo, and uh, I'm planning to soon uh, uh, have the source code or this implementation in the Fabric Samples uh, official repository, so uh, uh, people can refer from uh, that as well. But meanwhile, since that code is not present there, you can just refer this uh, particular repository. Okay, now the approval phase is going on. 
uh, we can see that we got the approval from one org, uh, which is from uh, org one. And then uh, we also got the approval from second org. And then now the commit phase should happen. Yeah, so here we can see that it was uh, committed successfully and we got the transaction ID for that uh, trans for that commit transaction that happened. Okay, so uh, now chain code is also installed. Uh, let's try to see actually if uh, all these certificates work or not. So I'll try to invoke a chain code. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll call one of the function from the uh, from this chain code. So this chain code has a couple of functions, and one of the function is uh, init ledger. I just quickly pasted the command from my uh, uh, other screen, and uh, I'm doing a peer chain code invoke, passing some uh, passing the endpoint for the ordering node, then I'm passing the TLS certificates and uh, giving the chain code name as uh, basic. Uh, and then I have to give the peer addresses and who all will be the part of endorsement. So since it uses the end, end endorsement policy, so I have to give the uh, peer addresses for both the nodes. And I'm calling this uh, init ledger function, which is there in the chain code. So I just invoke the chain code and I got the result as 200. Uh, let's see if this uh, we can actually get the results from uh, chain code or not. So I'll call a query. I'll do a query on the chain code and uh, let's see if we get the results or not so we got something uh not readable let me just pipe this to jq yeah so we can see we got some records returned from the chain code and this init ledger function uh that we just you know uh invoked uh this was supposed to add few of uh few like few records in the ledger and uh it added these records like it added i think five records or six records into the ledger and we can see all these details uh, here. Let's do one more uh, invocation. And uh, what I'll do is I'll try to create uh, one record onto the ledger. So let's, so here I'm calling the create asset function. Again, this function is present in the chain code. This function accepts five arguments. So I'm giving the five arguments. So the first argument is the asset ID. Second argument is the asset color. Third is the size. Fourth is the owner. And fifth is the appraised value. Uh, we can go through the chain code as well, just for a quick glance. So the chain code must be present in this asset transfer directory and chain code JavaScript inside lib. You have this asset transfer.js. And uh, let me just hold this. Yeah, so uh, remember uh, the init ledger, init ledger function that we invoked uh, just a few seconds ago. Uh, we can see it was creating up some assets onto the ledger, and this is an array of uh, asset. It was looping on the top of that array, writing it to the ledger. Then the second function that we'll call is create asset, and this expects five parameters that I have you know listed here, like the ID, uh, color, size, and uh, owner. And all those parameters I have listed here, and it will basically create that uh, record into the ledger. Let's try to run this. So uh, it uh, the invoke was successful, and it returned as the response as well, uh, because we were trying to return the response. From here, you can see the return is response. So that's why it returned as the uh, uh, whatever we tried to write into the ledger. Uh, so now let's try to do query once. Uh, what all assets we have. And this, this time we should see seven records into the ledger. Uh, so we can see the fresh asset that I created uh, or the fresh record that I created. This is also coming from the ledger. And uh, now let's try to invoke one last function from this chain code, which is uh, asset transfer. And uh, this expects two parameter like the ID and the own, new owner of that asset. So I'll try to transfer this particular asset that I just created. Uh, which has an ID as 100 and the owner as Aditya. And I'll try to transfer this asset to some uh, other user. So let me just clear up this. Let's expand it. And here I'm trying to again do the chain code invocation. The function that I'm going to call is transfer asset. The ID of that asset is 100. 
and the new owner is going to be Nitin. So uh, this this asset will be transferred to Nitin uh, on the uh, and when you, when we'll see the uh, all the assets in the uh, from the ledger, we'll see that the asset is transferred to uh, Nitin or the new owner is Nitin. So the invoke was successful. Let's try to do a query again. And if we see here, so uh, this is this was the asset that we just transferred. The ID was 100. Color and other details are same what uh, it used to be earlier. And the new owner is Nitin. And uh, yeah, and this data is coming from the state DB. We are not, uh, or uh, we are not trying to get the history of that asset. So that's why you see the latest state, uh, which is there for that uh, particular record. Yeah, I think uh, I think yeah, this is what I wanted to show uh, uh, in this today's session, and uh, I'm happy for uh, questions if there is any now. Yeah, Ramesh, uh, is the TLS which is generated, is it self-signed or uh, no? Okay. So TLS certificate is also, it's not self-signed. It is also, again, issued from the CFSSL uh, in this case. And uh, we have to, when when we issue the certificate space, I'm talking here, talking in the terms of this binary that I'm using. Uh, so when you uh, issue up the certificate, you need to provide the profile. And uh, if you not provide the valid profile, so I when I was experimenting with this tool, uh, I was not paying attention to the profile part, and uh, uh, it was kind of not working for me because uh, that profile has the uh, detail for the signing certificate, so it was not working. So you will explicitly provide the profiles whenever you are generating the certs. But if, if I would like to bring up the you know uh, SSL from like Godaddy or name chief, yes, that, that, that uh, will yeah. also work. Uh, that should also work. So you can you 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 can, you can have some combination like this where you might be using you know uh, this binary or utility for just for signing certificate, but for TLS you want to use some you know uh, uh, CAs uh, global CAs like uh, the Cloudflare or the Godaddy like any kind of uh, CAs you can use for getting the TLS certificate. So any extra advantages uh, on top of the fabric CA to take it this uh, so, uh, so 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 one uh, advantage uh, I can say is uh, uh, not 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 specifically on the uh, on the on this CA because again uh, they both are CA they both are doing similar kind of a job and at the end of the day the expectation from the uh, we have some set of expectations from the CAs uh, like the issuing of the certificate the cert management revocation part all these uh, parameters are you know fulfilled by both the certificate authorities uh, uh, so one one advantage uh, that i see with this particular ca is like uh, uh, it, it basically completely exposes uh, rest apis and you know you can you, you you can plug it with any kind of a database that you are running and this can uh, be leveraged for uh, for generating of the certificate, let's say let's say you have a certificate that which are coming from well established, you know, uh, certificate authority, and you can basically instead of using CFSL generated certificate as the as the root certificate for uh, following uh, certificate issuance, you can use the that particular uh, uh, CA certificate and issuing the certificate. So I see advantage in when you want to you know do things programmatically because it has a good support on the APIs part as well. You can issue of the certificate on the fly with the help of REST APIs. And one more last question. Uh, uh, does it have features like auto renewal of the certificate and no, integrating no, no. with the world? So, no. so, 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 so these are the features uh, uh, that, you, that I mean, uh, so one thing is that these two systems are completely independent systems. Uh, we need to remember this thing that the CA is an independent system and that is how we are able to achieve the pluggability. Uh, uh for the for the certificates like if you will if you will do a tight coupling between these the, between these components then definitely you will be able to achieve the cert rotation and all those things like the management can be much smoother but then you will lose the uh you you will lose the pluggability like you will never be able to use you know any uh other uh other cs because the, then the coupling is kind of quite tight so again that the problem still uh is there 
uh, of the cert manager and that uh, again you have to do it by yourself because these are independent systems they there is no integration and if, if you if you saw this uh, initial part of the demo uh, i generated the certificate in a, in, in a you know before actually bootstrapping as a network so at the end of the day the requirement from the node is you provide them a valid certificate uh, uh into valid in terms of the algorithm that is used valid in terms of the membership or the if, if there is a chaining that is properly needs to be followed uh, valid in terms of the usage that is needed uh, like the signing usage or the TLS usage, you provide all these parameters or you know uh, capabilities that is needed, and you uh, are good to go to bootstrap your network. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, it's a really good presentation to know extend the CA capabilities in the fabric. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, I, I I just wanted to you know bring this to a larger audience this presentation or this this kind of a topic because I see that. Uh, 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 there are not much information available on the internet around uh, uh, around having uh, or how you can actually use the uh, multiple or different CAs, how you can do the chaining. So I think, yeah, uh, uh, my intention was uh, uh, this only to have this presentation among the audience. Yeah, sure, only thanks. the folder structure which we need to maintain so that any CA can bring it to the fabric so that you know we cannot uh, you know leverage the existing network structure and it works. right so it's it's a requirement coming from the node itself uh if you not provide the certificates in the in the in the valid directories on the required directories uh again you will not be able to bootstrap the network because uh nodes are internally using those directories to identify like where exactly the key is present where exactly is the signing certificate present uh yeah Right. Okay. So thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Aditya, for this, you know, insightful and, you know, interesting session. So with that, you know, uh, I, you know, in the interest of time, I'll, you know, hand it over to Lakshay. So we have Lakshay, you know, uh, representing Z. So uh, they'll, you know, go through how we can set up an enterprise, you know, uh, network, right? Enterprise grade network in Hyperledger Fabric. So I think, you know, it's in continuation and, you know, some of the things probably, uh, you know, would be, some of your questions might be answered over there as well. So uh, for that, for the next interesting session, handing over to Ravi and Aditya, sorry, Ravi and, you know, Lakshay from Z. Over to you. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Ravi. I'm the co-founder CEO of Zeev. And before I hand over to Lakshay for um, demonstrating the whole platform, I'll just give a quick um, ten minutes overview of what what Zeev is and what what uh, we are doing in the infra space. Um, <clears throat> so um, we have been into blockchain space for more than five years. And uh, we have been building the Zeev no code platform for the last two and a half years. Um, we uh, support almost 30 plus uh, uh, protocols today. And we have uh, a very good traction uh, in terms of 18,000 plus developers are using the platform with 30 plus large enterprises. And uh, um, we have, uh, we are a team of now 100 plus people and, and uh, um, we continue to add more and more protocols. And we are very excited. We are uh, very uniquely positioned for enterprise blockchains. And we provide complete automation of uh, enterprise blockchain frameworks. So now uh, um, briefly about, you know, what are the challenges while managing blockchain infrastructure? So one, uh, uh, doing it manually is very uh, uh, time consuming. And at the same time, it's very difficult to ascertain the cost of uh, not just the deployments, but ongoing maintenance of blockchain infrastructure. So um, uh, in, in infrastructure, which are being driven by one organization, uh, it's still comparatively easier, but when we talk about consortiums, the uh, infrastructure management become very difficult. And especially, uh, um, you know, a consortium may have stakeholders with preferences of different cloud environments. So it, it adds to the complexity and how to bring in or onboard a stakeholder when the network is up and running. Uh, that again is a, is a very big challenge to solve. And then, of course, you know, cost optimization, et cetera, becomes even much more important. Uh, you do not want to waste uh, uh, precious cloud resources. So uh, how to manage those optimization on the fly, scaling up, scaling down. And um, uh, moreover, you know, um, 
right now the whole manually deployment of uh, uh, blockchain infrastructure is is based on whatever scripts etc are available in the market but then uh, uh, is that the uh, um, best way to do it is most standardized way to do it that again uh, uh, requires a lot of know-how and expertise and uh, uh, lastly but most important is um, there's a lack of standardization in terms of security or optimization or managing compliance and regulations within the network whether it be data resiliency or privacy or security etc so these are uh, uh, some of the challenges that we have seen uh, um, enterprises or web3 startups they struggle with and uh, so what what uh, uh, is, is required to manage this so one you know there needs to be a very high level of automation which gives you a lot of configurable choices while setting up a network or uh, as simple as a public protocol node but when we talk about hyperledger fabric or besu or art free coda of course the complexity uh, becomes much much more because you are setting up a network different kind of nodes channels organizations all kind of configurations are required um and then of course you know you require security of the rpc endpoints uh, you need to ensure there's a uh, privacy and security as per the guidelines of the enterprise that again becomes very important and then uh, um for consortium again the whole process needs to be as simple as so if an organization start a consortium um maybe you know choosing aws as the primary cloud environment but then other stakeholders may have a different cloud preference so there should be a very easy way of of um allowing the stakeholders to deploy on different clouds connect to the same network uh follow all the policies of the network um whether it be related to governance or privacy or security so that should be uh, um, uh, comparatively very easy so that you know uh, infrastructure itself does not become a major challenge to grow or scale a consortium and then you know uh, from a decentralization perspective also having different clouds uh, coming together and in, in fact uh, on premise also because uh, there would be certain nodes people would prefer to put in on premise again based on their security data security etc basis and uh, a lot of choice to the consortium partners and then uh, uh, post deployment, as we are very used to in the web two space, we we require very sophisticated analytics, proactive monitoring across the uh, uh, resources, whether it be underlying cloud resources or whether it be blockchain resources. So both both becomes very important. Um, so there needs to be a very uh, uh, cool dashboard which provides you all kind of alerts, notifications, and in fact. Uh, using AI, you know, automate some of the uh, uh, problem solving pieces like self healing nodes. And that is where, you know, uh, Zeev comes in. It's a low code to no code uh, blockchain as a service, infrastructure as a service platform, which is enterprise grade. We support um, uh, almost 30 plus uh, blockchain protocols, including all the major permission ones. Uh, we started our journey with Hyperledger and we today support uh, uh, the most configurable platform for uh, Hyperledger Fabric. And now we are extending in Q2 with Hyperledger Besu and Aries. And we continue to add other suite of products uh, onto the platform. And then we support uh, heterogeneous cloud deployments. Uh, we have native support for six clouds today, AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, DigitalOcean, Linode, and Tencent. Tencent is the latest one that we have launched. And now we are adding a few more uh, uh, cloud environments into the platform, again, to uh, uh, provide decentralization in large consortiums. And at the same time, you know, give cost advantage because different cloud has got uh, cost advantage across different kind of resources and sometimes from use cases perspective comfort what kind of uh, devops or developers are comfortable with so it gives a lot of choices with uh, heterogeneous cloud deployments and we provide uh, uh, um, um, a monitoring dashboard where you can um, see uh, and, and monitor not just the cloud resources but also blockchain resources and in the case of uh, some custom smart contract data also that can be managed on the platform Plus, there are proactive alerts and notification uh, so that uh, um, the platform ensures that the infra is up and running. And then uh, uh, we have automated CI CD pipelines, native integration with GitHub and various other repos. And we continue to add more and more API integrations with various DevOps tool sets uh, to make the life easier for a developer or a startup to uh, build their applications. So in the nutshell, uh, um, uh, it provides you know huge amount of cost saving, not just for the initial deployments, but ongoing monitoring of the networks, faster time to market, uh, 
because um, if it takes two to three weeks to set up a network with proper security, compliances, standardization, et cetera, with Zeev, you can do it in minutes. And uh, that becomes very handy while you are developing because you may need to um, set up the network, you know, uh, terminate it and reset it up. So with in, in minutes, you can do that. So these are some of the extensive features, uh, like multiple cloud provisioning, one-click node deployments, unified dashboard. And then we are uh, we provide a uh, uh, few value-added services like decentralized storage as a service, which is IPFS-based service. But you can simply use the service rather than you know deploying your own IPFS nodes. Similarly, we have extended to IoT as a service, and then we are working on trusted execution environment and then asset tokenization, secure key vault uh, for managing your keys, et cetera. So there are quite a few. So we're trying to cover the whole gamut of services which typically a DAP developer would need while building a blockchain application. So in terms of value proposition from manual deployments to no-code deployments, faster time to market, uh, save huge cost. And then, you know, uh, manual deployments, sometimes, you know, it's not very standardized. Uh, what kind of orchestration to use, whether it's most optimized from a blockchain protocol perspective, as well as from a cost and time perspective. Uh, with Zeev, you get uh, full error-free uh, deployments with all proactive monitoring. And then in uh, Q2, we are coming up with self-healing nodes, which will solve quite a few challenges uh, within the network, proactively monitor it and solve it also. And then uh, 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 we take care of all the uh, security and compliances. We are ISO 27001 and SOC2 compliant. And uh, uh, we do the server hardening and all the hard work on, this, on the security side. So don't need to worry about whether the server has been configured or um, set it up or, or set up based on the best security guidelines. So we use all the best practices of security. Um, so we provide uh, um, you know, developer nodes and archive nodes. We uh, provide shared APIs for public protocols. We uh, provide, you know, staking node infrastructure and then complete uh, uh, setup of network, whether it be Hyperledger Fabric, R3 Coda, uh, Avalon Subnets, Polygon Edge, and, and various other enterprise protocols. Um, so in terms of early traction, we have uh, uh, some of the large customers like Vodafone, DCB Bank, Energy Web Foundation, and a uh, uh, lot of hundreds of uh, Web3 startups who are using the platform. In terms of partnership, we are part of the Hyperledger Foundation. We are also a member of Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. We are partner with uh, AWS, R3 Coda, and Flurry, which is a distributed database. And then we work with quite a few uh, system integrators and consulting companies. That's also, I'll, I'll uh, pass over to Lakshya, who will run through the demo. And if there would be any questions, I'm, I'm, I'm here to answer that. Sure. Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Ravi. I'll start sharing my screen and then we can all um, go through the demonstration. Right, I hope my screen is visible. All right, so um, I'm at Zee's website. Um, it's zeev.io where you can look up all the public protocols and all the enterprise protocols that we support. Along with the protocols, you'll also find some uh, documentations and uh, tutorial videos to help you start with the network creation and your account setup, uh, different ways to uh, spin up a network, uh, different ways to authorize your cloud account. And uh, if you want to skip authorization for your cloud account, how you can create a, a Zeev network or a blockchain network uh, without having a cloud account. So all that information is is uh, is is present in the website itself. A uh, bunch of pricing that you can uh, uh, look for, and then um, log in, sign up to start uh, using your account. So I'll be using uh, this demonstration account for this presentation. Other than uh, you know uh, having your own email ID, you can also uh, use other social handles like GitHub or Google to start with your account. Right, let's start from the dashboard. So uh, once you once you log into the Z platform, you'll see a bunch of information, uh, different components that helps you as a blockchain engineer, as a DevOps engineer who's working with blockchain services to understand you know, uh, different uh, parts of your network. So first part that you want to look at is the cloud uses distribution that I'm uh, uh, that I've spanned across my networks and services into. 
so if you see in my account, you'll see that most of the networks have been deployed in AWS and some of the services are running in DigitalOcean as well. But I do have other uh, cloud account associated with my Zeev uh, account, uh, which includes GCP and Tencent. So we'll take a look at uh, cloud authorization piece as well. Um, so after that, you'll see different components that Zeev creates uh, 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 for you. Uh, some of them are workspaces where you can encapsulate your network into uh, uh, into one department or into one environment. It could be you know, staging, development, or uh, production. Same, it shows you uh, total number of networks count that you have created in your uh, uh, Zeev account, a number of nodes, and uh, any RPC endpoints that you're consuming as of now, uh, cloud accounts that you've authorized with Zeev. And then there is protocol is protocol wise distribution of your networks. So far, I've only created one fabric network. And if I had more networks, it would be, it would be coming here. And then we have uh, system health information to help you understand your account usage and uh, uh, you know different warnings and alerts if there are any. So um, if you had any fatal issues or warnings that your nodes are uh, coming up with, uh, you you can look it look them up. And uh, in future releases, you'll see you know these nodes healing themselves like Dr. Ravi explained in the presentation. Uh, for now, you'll see the warnings, you'll see the alerts, and you can you know go to Zeev panels and you can also auto scale your nodes and services and infra services where your uh, blockchain services are running. Now let's look at uh, settings section to understand how, um, as a as an enterprise or as a as a individual user, how I can authorize my own cloud account to uh, allow Zeev to uh, create networks uh, and and hold the data storage or hold the infra services at my end. So if you come to settings and you go to my cloud section, you'll see the cloud uh, accounts that are supported as of now. So once you click on AWS, you'll see there is that AWS cloud button. Uh, once you click on it, you'll see uh, this small form which uh, is going to ask you some details. So uh, you can put down name of your uh, um, authorization that you're going to provide here, and then you can provide your access key and secret key, which you can generate using IAM section of uh, AWS. And you can provide limited permissions to uh, to the uh, type of deployment that you're going to do through Zeev. And then there is credential label. So uh, deployment types are different according to the blockchain protocol you choose for your network creation. Uh, for enterprise networks, uh, high reliability is is a concern. For uh, uh, individual or, or uh, uh, public networks, uh, connectivity and uh, uh, cost is a concern. So I have one account here. I can add more accounts according to my need, and then I can also add uh, DigitalOcean and same way I have GCP authorized with my uh, Zeev account. With GCP, I can also uh, authorize a bunch of projects that I have inside my organization GCP. And uh, same goes for Tencent if I have, so Tencent registration is not here, but I can add Tencent and it will take me to all the OAuth settings there. Other than interacting uh, with Zeev platform as a as a web console, you can also utilize uh, Zeev CLI to automate your smart contract uh, deployments and smart contract migrations onto your networks. So imagine, uh, you know, uh, creating uh, running a fabric network and then there are uh, uh, smart contract updates or chain code updates that you want to do uh, regularly on your network. So that can be done using uh, Zeev CLI. You can imagine creating uh, pipelines for your different environments and different branches and uh, Zeev CLI will help you, you know, automate all the operations that goes along with, with along with the life cycle of the chain code itself. So uh, we'll, we'll look at it uh, in a few minutes once we uh, cover up the presentation here. So if you want to uh, create an API credential, you can click on uh, API credentials here and then go to create key section. Okay, then you have to provide a few details like uh, provided a key name and the type of service that you want to create this key for. So there is uh, Zeev's uh, DFS, um, which is a different thing. We'll, we'll see it in a coming session as well. Uh, you can select networks from the networks list. If I had more networks, you'll see them here and, and then I can select the networks that I want this key to be authorized for. Uh, similarly, I can provide more permissions to my key. I can uh, decide if I just want this key to run pipelines or if I want this key to done to uh, do more operation. Uh, so I can uh, allow it more permissions in, in the permission section here. Once I allow permissions, once I click create, it will generate uh, one secret key and one access key for me that can be used uh, along with GCLI to run automation pieces for me. Um, after that, uh, once you've authorized your cloud account, uh, then there is a workspace creation that you can look into where uh, you can create a first workspace. Now workspaces have uh, different advantages uh, over your network. So you can uh, 
couple your networks into one workspace. You can also allow different uh, team members into workspaces. You can allow them a bunch of permissions to, uh, you know, just have read permissions or have them write permissions onto your network. If there are any specific actions that you want to allow, that would be applied in a workspace wise and then uh, up to the uh, networks that are deployed inside the workspace. So I have a bunch of workspaces here. Uh, and then I have one workspace for my fabric networks here. Um, same way if I go to my fabric networks workspace, I'll see um, there is one network running already. Now, if I want to add a network in my uh, fresh receive account, I won't see this network here. I would have to do add network. And then I would see the subscriptions that I've bought for my uh, receive account. So my account has a bunch of subscriptions here. Uh, same way you can you know buy, buy different subscription for different cloud accounts that you want to authorize. And if I want to uh, buy a subscription for other uh, protocols, I can do so you know, using subscription section or marketplace section here. Uh, so there is public protocols that we support, bunch of public protocols, and then uh, some permissive protocols that we support. So there is R3 Corda, there is Fabric, and then there is Polygon Edge. So if I wanted to use Fabric, I click on Fabric, and then inside Fabric, I'll see uh, subscription options here. So there is one more option which provides you a free tier trial subscription where you don't have to uh, uh, buy the subscription or pay the pricing. As of now, you do BYOC approach, and then uh, you select the number of orders and peers that are pre-selected, and you get you know get to deploy one order and one peer into your network. Uh, for enterprises, uh, they can uh, uh, select BYOC and then they can select the cloud account that they want to go for uh, and then uh, select the nodes types and the count of node services that are going to select and uh, that they're going to deploy. Uh, if you don't want to deploy or, or integrate your own cloud account, Zeev allows you to create, you know, manage uh, account settings where you are not have you don't have to worry about the uh, cloud costs and uh, infra sections. Zeev will take care of it all. And you just uh, you can just create the network, and you know you can start using the services once they are created. So let's look at um, how we easily we can create a fabric network. I'll go to dedicated node section here, and I can go to add network. And from add network itself, I can select the subscription uh, that is there for my account. And then we'll see uh, the different steps and forms that are there for uh, to create a fabric network. Now, the entire Fabric network creation is divided into four steps. Last step is to decide my cloud configuration. And uh, other three steps are just for Fabric settings. So first step is to decide my Fabric version. Uh, if I want to go with uh, 2.2 LTS or if I want to go with 1.4 LTS. With 1.4, there are a different choice of consensus type that I can go with. You know, I can select Kafka, Solo, or Raft. And if I go to uh, 2.2, I can only select Raft as other consensus have been deprecated. Now, next step is to decide my organization uh, details or uh, architecture of my organizations. Now I can add more, uh, any amount of organization that I want to add. Each organization is going to have uh, one CA and one TLS CA. And the deployment itself uh, that uh, uh, Zeev creates for your Fabric network is, is going to be done on Kubernetes clusters. Now these clusters are also created with uh, within mind that uh, these services that are going to be deployed, your blockchain services are going to be deployed on private subnets such that they only have access to you know outside internet that no one can connect uh, 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 to them uh, without having to go through the uh, uh, load balance that have been uh, put in front of them. So I can provide um, my admin username here and the same way I can provide some uh, strong password to my uh, admin uh, uh, CA. And then I can decide if I want this CA service to be uh, uh, spinned up with a persistent volume, which helps me uh, scale the service down when I have the you know cluster administrative access. I can provide it uh, uh, size, it could be 10 GB or 100 GB according to my need, according to the uh, network size that I'm imagining with my, uh, with my services. And uh, if you're just going to create a dev network or a test network, it is, uh, advisable that you don't uh, you know put down extra cost for the P pvcs or pvs that are going to be created for your services uh, same way i can add more orders into my network and um, i can also remove orders if i don't want to uh, in my organization and i can add same way peers into my uh, organization and with peers i have this choice of database support if i have complex smart contract i can uh, deploy one couch db along with my peer service already integrated you know um, and then I can decide if I want my cows uh, service to have a persistent volume, same way if I want to have the same setting for my peer volume or my order volume. And then there are CSR details, which is a certificate signing request where you allow or we, we, where you define the details for your identities that are going to be created in your network. 
So I can put down these details and all the identities that are going to be created, including my client or user identities, and then peer and order identities with the uh, CSR details that I provide here. So this, it's very important to fill this down when, you, when you're creating a staging network, production network. Um, and if I do next, um, so it is going to advise me to add at least three orders since uh, it is advisable to have at least three orders in a raft uh, ecosystem. So I can add more or I can just skip this warning and I can you know go through uh, next step and uh, be starting with my network. Now, last step is to uh, decide my channel settings where there are system channel settings and then there are some default values that are already pre-filled by Z for you. So if you want to you know, customize these system channel settings, you can do so. Z allows you that capability of flexibility. And then there is application channel settings which, where you can uh, this, uh, decide the application channel that you want to deploy or create with your network to be bootstrapped and ready to be, you know, used with your blockchain services. So once I click this checkbox, it not it does not only create an application channel, it also makes sure that all the peers that are uh, added in my organization settings uh, join this particular channel. So my network would be bootstrapped with a particular application channel and I, and, and I would have peers uh, already joined uh, that channel. Now at the cloud configuration setting, I have uh, already pre-filled uh, cloud settings for me. Uh, there is AWS because I, sub because I selected uh, uh, BYOC AWS subscription. Same way if I had different subscription, my details would be pre-filled according to my uh, subscription details. And then here I can provide my uh, name to my network. Now let's say I want to provide it uh, HLF uh, dev, which is high pleasure fabric dev network for me. And then I can decide the workspace that I want to deploy my uh, fabric network into. Let's say I want to deploy it in fabric network section only. Uh, then I can decide my uh, cloud account. Uh, if I had more cloud account, I can select from this drop down. And then same way, I can decide the region that I want to deploy it into. So um, you can decide according to your uh, 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 proximity wise. If, if if you are in different region, you would choose you know some some data center that are close to you. Uh, for me, it's AP South one. So let's say I want to go with AP South one. Um, and then I can decide number of fences. So the, the, these number of fences are going to be my worker nodes uh, count for my uh, Kubernetes cluster that is going to deploy into my cloud account. And then I can decide the worker node instance type. So it will, um, let's say I want to create T3 medium for my worker node uh, instance type. So the deployment uh, that Zeev creates uh, is a high availability deployment. So it spans your instances or nodes, uh, nodes that you create across all the name, uh, all the availability zones that are uh, provided to you by the cloud provider. So for example, in DigitalOcean, there is no uh, AZ concept, but with AWS and GCP, there is. So we create um, uh, uh, worker node groups and you know other AZs as well. So you get uh, a high availability option in your cluster where one of AZ goes down, but other AZs are up. So your, your, your uh, scheduling you know, still happens to other AZs and your, and your services are still up. So if I click create now, Z is going to uh, do some uh, validations if I have enough resources in my cloud account. If not, then it would it is going to you know put down a warning or uh, an alert here that you know you need to remove this thing uh, from your cloud account first. So uh, to create a fabric network in AWS, uh, it takes uh, around. 20 or 25 minutes to uh, create the infrastructure, which is Kubernetes cluster, and then uh, creating the instances and then making them worker nodes into and joining them into my my EKS cluster, and then five to 10 minutes for Z to provision the blockchain services onto your uh, infra that you've created. So to save us some time, I already have this uh, network running here, demo network, where we can look into. So once I go into my uh, network, I'll see a bunch of options and bunch of details that I can see. So it shows me the organization uh, summary where I can see uh, the organization that my account holds. I can see I am, I'm the owner of ORG1 and it has one pair and three orders. If it's a part, so part of consortium, then it's true that there means I'm a part of system channel. Uh, it's the owner email address, that is me, my, my Zeev account. And then I can uh, download my artifacts through this download artifacts button and I can connect to my uh, organization services, which includes order services and peer services. I also get to see the uh, uh, network wide view of the organizations and their services. So if there were more organizations, I would see you know different graph here. And if I scroll scroll down below, I'll see the channels that have, uh, that uh, this network holds. So it only has one channel. 
and it has only one peer and uh, zero ch chain codes are installed in this uh, uh, in this channel. Same way, I can download channel JSON, which will give me the channel configuration entirely, and I can read it and I can do you know a bunch of uh, modification operation on it. Now, let's say I want to download these artifacts to connect with my application SDK. I can do so. So once this download is completed, I'll get to see the um, files that are inside there. Um, so I'm assuming that I, uh, the uh, the audience can't see my screen, but uh, it, it shows me uh, the zip that has been downloaded and the connection JSON profile that has been downloaded through uh, uh, through this organization uh, artifact section. So connection JSON profile is going to help you to connect your application SDKs uh, so that your developers or you know if you are a developer, you don't have to put down your efforts into creating these tiny details and uh, that usually requires more time and efforts to connect with your high pleasure fabric networks. Um, if I go into channel section, I'll see the channel configuration again and more details into channels. So if I had chain codes, I would see chain codes here. But if uh, if I want to see policies that were this this channel was created with, I can see that. Same way, I can create more channels and I'll see the channel details here. Now, other than this, uh, uh, I can see organization sections that are there, and then uh, org details and the channels that it supports, and then I can see my C8 details. And if I want to create more identities, I can do so with my uh, create user identity section here, and then I can enroll them. I can create certificate identity for them. I can put down the username, so you don't have to, you know, uh, go to your application SDKs directly. Um, same way, you get to uh, interact with your services. Uh, you can see the status of your services. You can view the uh, analytics on your services. You can start, stop them, or even delete them from your network uh, to save some uh, uh, cost. And uh, other than this, you get to uh, you don't have to you know go to your cloud account to manage your infrastructure. Uh, you can manage your infrastructure through Zeef uh, uh, panel only, where you'll see you know region that this uh, infrastructure was deployed in, availability zones that this uh, infrastructure is using, number of worker nodes um, that uh, this network is running as of now. So I can add more number of worker nodes. I can decide again my instance type that I want to go with. I can select the zone that uh, I want this new worker node to be, and then I can, I can decide the number of worker nodes for my um, new worker node. And then similarly, I can rescale my existing worker nodes as well, or I can delete them to save some cost. Now, um, with Zeev, you don't have to you know, worry about uh, analytics side as well. So we provide you integrated analytics on your uh, cluster-wide uh, resources as well as your blockchain resources. So analytics side, you can drill down into you know, uh, nodes inside your cluster. You can also drill down into the uh, uh, namespaces that are deployed uh, or that have been created in, inside your cluster. And uh, we get to see the uh, uh, details of the uh, analytics here. It's uh, still coming up. I go to K note section. I'll see my uh, note details in a minute. Right, it's still uh, uh, coming up because my network is fresh. I'll uh, check the year details and see if I can get some details onto uh, blockchain analytics side. Right, so I have some uh, blockchain level details for my uh, uh, peers that I've deployed in my uh, uh, network. And uh, same way, if I had any blocks being processed as of now, I'll see those details here as well. And uh, uh, commits and number of uh, warnings, if there are any, I can see the version that was deployed with my peer. Uh, also, I can see peer logs, so I can change some details here so that we can see, um, we can see the details that it was deployed with. Yeah, I deployed it at, uh, some more, some back time. I'll see some blocks at this point. Right. Uh, so it doesn't generate. Uh, it hasn't generated any logs. But yeah, we'll see some order logs in in a minute. Um, and then we can see all the actions that uh, your network uh, uh, supports uh, in terms of you know adding more organizations into your network and uh, adding more uh, uh, channels into your network, adding more peers to your organization. So I can see all the live logs that my order services is producing. Um, same way, uh, let's, let's go back to 
my uh, fabri network now uh, other than analytics uh, details and data and alerts that you get to see uh, integrated in your network uh, we have bunch of actions that we support on your uh, network uh, so there is ad peer there is ad organization there is a uh, create channel for your uh, uh, for your network now let's say you want to uh, scale up your network in terms of channels you can do so you can create more channels into your network so let's say i want to uh, deploy a zeef channel here you can do so and then i can decide the organization that is going to be part of it so i add this one particular organization that i have then i can decide the policies that i want this uh, 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 network to have let's say i want to provide uh, every member to be you know writer and then same goes for admin details and then i can provide my endorsement section as well settings as well now then i can decide my application configuration and then my channel configuration so all of these details have been you know drilled down into all the options that you would want to uh, do now uh, these are all pre configured uh, uh, conditions that you would want to select uh, same goes for uh, every uh, uh, section that you see here once i'm uh, done with it the automation uh, piece will automatically create my channel and makes sure that uh, I all I you know make sure that the peers that I've selected uh, joins this channel. So if I had more peers, I would see a bunch of uh, uh, peer list here where I can uh, select if I want this peer to be part of my network and uh, part of my channel or not. Yeah, so uh, this is going to create my channel into my network. Um, so it will take a while to create a channel. Uh, after this, we can see how we can. Uh, do the automations on on part of your smart contract. So there is one chain code that has already been uh, created inside this network. If I go into my chain code setting, I'll see uh, the life cycle that it follows. So far now, my chain code has already is already been packaged. So these are pipelines uh, that you run for your smart contracts, and it, and inside pipelines you get to see there could be multiple jobs uh, there that these pipelines could be running. Uh, so if I click on this uh, uh, pipeline, I'll see the logs that this job produced. And if I click on it, I'll see oh, the operations that uh, uh, Zeev ran in the background. So I can see that, okay, it uh, created a Docker image for my uh, uh, channel to package, and then it pushed into my ECR that uh, was created inside my cloud account. Same way I, uh, I can do, uh, uh, I can update my smart contracts lifecycle. I can uh, install it, approve it, and deploy and commit it. Uh, we can do so. Uh, I'll have to reshare my screen for that. Um, let me resh uh, let me reshare my uh, CLI section so you can see the um, CLI section here. Yeah. So I hope you you're able to see my uh, uh, my uh, my Linux session here. Yep. All right. So. It's uh, very easy to install Zeev CLI. Uh, it can be installed using npm package manager. You can install it uh, globally into your uh, uh, into your environment. So once you do this, uh, it will uh, install the latest version for you. I already have it installed in my uh, in my machine, so I don't have to install it again. But if I do so, I'll I'll get the latest version that is out there for Zeev. So once I uh, do Zeev help, I'll see the operation that it supports for different protocols. Uh, so there is card operation that it supports and there is one option to run it as an agent and then there is fabric operation that it supports. So let's look down or drill down into fabric operations. So for fabric, we have chain code uh, capabilities. If I drill down into chain code, I'll see the operation that it supports for uh, uh, my smart contract. So I can see that it helps me package the smart contract. It helps me install it, approve it, and then commit and deploy it. So let's say I want to uh, see the option that I would provide for installing a chain code. Um, yeah, so it it uh, it asks you for a bunch of details. So it it, it is going to ask you for network ID uh, that you can get from your uh, Zeev section where you'll see. Uh, I mean, there is a there's an information section you can copy it from, and then uh, there, then you have to provide a chain code name that you want to install a chain code as 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 for, and then chain code version which you want to uh, uh, start with your smart contract, and then organization that you want to install into your uh, uh, into your chain code. And then there are peer URLs, which means uh, the number of peers or, or specific peers that you want to install this chain code into. Now I have this uh, automation script, uh, which is going to help me uh, run these operations uh, for me. So I have, you know, a, a CLI argument that, that Zeev's, uh, CLI is going to require. So you can put down your network ID and and you'll see the access key and secret key that is that it is consuming from the uh, CLI section that we saw earlier while we were uh, authorizing our cloud account. 
So we have to, uh, before we start with the operation, we have to uh, authorize our session here. So it's it's a small operation when we have to log in. And if you've already logged in, uh, uh, it creates a small session for you. And after that, uh, you can package your chain code and as well as you can install it. So install is going to uh, ask you for these details. And once you provide these details, you can simply run the operation here. So let's run this uh, script to see how uh, my chain code is going to be installed onto my, um, into my cloud account, to my network here. All right, I'll uh, reshare my screen again so that we can see the uh, Zeef panel there and we can see the action that we've done. So let's refresh this page and uh, yeah, let's go to, so I can see that status has been changed. My chain code was just installed. And if I go to the action setting here, I'll see the job that it is produced that it is producing. Yeah, so I can see that I installed my chain code with a uh, uh, with a particular identifier, and then uh, same way I can you know uh, do my other operations and going through the life cycle of the chain code itself, and it will deploy my chain code parts as an external service into my cluster. Um, same way, I think we can uh, we can see how uh, ZV is creating uh, or or um, ZV is uh, you know helping you with the uh, administration part of your cluster as well. I'll have to reshare my screen, but yeah, before we do that, uh, we can go to channels again, and we can see if our channel has been created. So our channel has been created. I if I go to uh, Zeev channel here, I can see that again it, it is going to have you know a bunch of policies, uh, which I provided earlier. So we can see it here. Same way, uh, I think if I go to my channel, I should see uh, the installed chain code. So okay, it, is, it does not have yet, but yeah, once we commit uh, chain code onto our channels, we'll get to see the chain codes uh, as well. Now we can see how I can add up here quickly. Uh, yeah, so it, it is going to ask me to uh, select my organization and then uh, the channel that I want to add my peer into, and then the settings that I want to uh, uh, deploy this peer with. Um, it is going to again create a peer uh, into my organization and it is going to deploy a peer part onto my cluster. Now, add organization is a is a tricky piece where uh, you can allow. Um, other participants to be part of a network, as well as you can uh, create your your organization into your into your same infra that you uh, that you're running. So it has uh, the same details that we saw in the network creation earlier. I can provide my organization name here. I can select the channel that I want this organization to be uh, joining, and I can provide it uh, CA details. And also, I can provide if I want this organization to be part of System Child Consortium. Once I do so, this organization is also allowed to add orders into it uh, into its uh, uh, section, and it will it will be owning some orders uh, uh, along with it. Uh, same way, I can provide you know uh, configuration in terms of policies for this organization, uh, and then once I click create, it will have you know peers and orders that are decided here. And uh, if I wanted to uh, create a proposal, I can do so by uh, providing the email ID and then that user will get the invite in his uh, email inbox and he'll have to you know go through the steps again that we saw in the uh, demonstration, including uh, cloud authorization and getting the subscription. And uh, once he do once he completes these steps, he'll be part of the consortium that we've created here and uh, uh, that way uh, uh, we'll be creating an onboarding partners onto our network. So let's download the uh, cluster access, but before we do so, uh, we can also see the blockchain details that uh, that can be used or that can be downloaded uh, onto your uh, machine. So it uh, gives me a network ID that is required to uh, uh, integrate with my ZCLI settings. And uh, I can also download my cluster access, which is nothing but uh, my uh, cube configuration, uh, which helps me access my cluster. So I'll, my, I'll share my screen again to uh, to help you understand how we can access our cluster uh, after uh, the network is being created through Zeev. So I've downloaded my I've downloaded my cluster file. Now let's do an ls here. So it has some uh, uh, files. Now let's say I want to create a, a cube config here. I can do so. I can. Uh, copy the contents that I uh, downloaded with my file from. Now it has created a cube configuration. I can uh, access my cluster that you created uh, using this file here. And then I can uh, see the 
parts and services that it is running. So I can see uh, there is there are a bunch of analytics services that Zeev is running along with the Zeev agent that uh, helps us get the uh, cluster analytics for me. And then there are um, blockchain namespaces, uh, which includes my organization's uh, uh, parts and services and containers. And same way I have C, CA services that are running. So that way, you don't only have to, uh, you know, depend upon Zeev. You can also do a bunch of other operations onto your infra. Uh, so Zeev just uh, provides you the capability to, you know, bootstrap your networks and uh, to run your networks in the in the longer run. You'll have your full access uh, uh, with, when you create your networks with Zeev. Um, so pretty uh, so far, we've covered uh, almost all of the operations. I'll uh, go back to uh, uh, my browser again to showcase uh, other uh, operations other than you know uh, fabric how you can uh, use rpc endpoints and how you can subscribe rpc uh, services and uh, protocols that we have other than fabric so yeah if you want to have shared notes and uh, endpoints that you want to subscribe for you can do so for these protocols and same way there are other uh, uh, services like zdfs where you get to you know uh, use integrated uh, uh, storage services, which is uh, our own version of IPFS, which you can use to you know, offer storage solutions. Right, so at this point, uh, we're pretty much done with our uh, pretty much uh, done with our presentation. If there are any questions, I think we can take them up. Is the cloud migration supported? Yeah, so uh, cloud migration uh, is is not supported through Zeev yet, but uh, yeah, we're going to add uh, in an upcoming versions. You'll see that not only you can uh, onboard your partners, you know. So when you onboard onboard a partner, he he'll have choice, you know, uh, uh, choosing a different cloud provider. But uh, in upcoming versions, we're going to provide you with the uh, with the. Uh, Capabilities so that you can, you know, add more organizations into your uh, network where, where you'll be the owner, but you can uh, select different cloud providers. So that capability you can have, but your yeah, cloud migration is, is not there yet. Uh, but yeah, there is some sort of migration that is uh, that is very, very much required in longer run, which is renewal of, of your certificate. So that sort of automation and uh, uh, migration would be here. Uh, is there any window to like see uh, the events? Uh, happening uh, in the network, like for any particular organization, can they view all the events like live? Right. So live events. Uh, no. Uh, uh, so you you can see the logs from your uh, of your services through the analytics section. Um, that way, you can see that your services are running and they are producing some amount of logs. But um, events wise, I think you'll have to uh, work on your own application SDK to subscribe for those events. But yeah, those capabilities is allowed because the service discovery option we uh, are allowed for for peer services and and order services that we uh, spin our uh, networks with. Hey, thank you, Lakshan. Thank you, Jeev. So, in fact, it is coming up with an enterprise grade solution. I have a couple of questions. Um, is this integrated with uh, some sort of LDAP where the enterprise is having already user accounts so that uh, it could be used it as a, a single solution or the SSO kind of? Um, no, I, I I don't think so. Uh, uh, I mean, that... that you mean uh, they'll, they'll sign on for the platform, accessing the Zeev platform or... Uh, so if I have an enterprise and then uh, I do have all my users in the LDAP, now, instead of creating again users in the Zeev, can it be integrated with my enterprise so that seamlessly both can work it out? Yeah, so we do have uh, open auth, uh, single sign-on also. So right now we are supporting GitHub integration and few other integrations, but yes, we can uh, provide LDAP integration also. Perfect, got it. And then uh, so you're coming up with an API for all this functionality or it is only the web console? No, so right now it's the web console. 
Uh, but yes, uh, uh, it's it's a microservices driven architecture. So if uh, certain services, let's say for example, dashboard, etc., for monitoring, if needs to be exposed, we can do that. Got it. The last two questions. I mean, uh, any 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 specific reason why Azure hasn't been integrated so far? I mean, or it's coming up in our roadmap. No, it is it is coming up. So Azure, in fact, we had uh, integrated earlier. We haven't upgraded it as yet. That's why Azure is not there, but Azure is a partner for us. We do support the deployments on Azure, but the automated native integration is, is still uh, in, in the roadmap. Okay, got it. Last question. Can you touch base on the G managed clause? How do you manage whether it is a SaaS based infrastructure or it is an isolated or customer? Uh, the cloud, uh, the, the, the decentralized storage or? Z managed cloud operations. Now you are showing all the uh, creating. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that we have a very distributed uh, infrastructure. We use multiple clouds to deploy a network. If there is a specific choice by the uh, by the user, then you know we can deploy uh, you know on AWS, Azure, or any of the clouds that. We... Got it. Got it. Thank you. That's all I have. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I have uh, one question, Lakshya. Uh, uh, is there a way to define uh, low level details for the channel uh, when creating up the channel, either through CLI or uh, through the UI itself? Okay, uh, uh, what exactly low, low so, level details? So, okay, so I want to define, let's say, some of the parameters for the channel, let's say block count or uh, 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 tran uh, that absolute number of blocks that I want to have. Right. Right. So that capability is there in system channel settings when, when you're creating your network uh, for the first time. But yeah, in application channel, yeah, I don't think there is there are such details provided. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and right now, uh, does it support like uh, those uh, channel participation APIs for uh, uh, in like decentralized ordering services? Participation APIs? Yeah, channel participation APIs. Uh, no, not yet. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Aaron, all of us. You know, it's, it was a great presentation, quite you know, uh, insightful, and I think you know, it's very important for anyone who is looking to you know, set up an enterprise network. And I see that you know, you guys have done a great job. So uh, thank you, you know, Lakshya and uh, for this you know, presentation. I think you. you know with that we are coming to a close. I think you know we are a bit early. Uh, so if, uh, unless anyone has any questions, you know we'll move towards you know closing ceremony. Uh, I would like to know your uh, thoughts on like how we we could transfer assets like from one channel to another. How would we do that? Or could that be done using some kind of event-driven architecture? Uh, you want to transfer assets, is it? Yeah, like chain code assets. Uh, whatever assets we have, can we transfer it from one channel like to another? Because oh yeah, it's basically. So chain code would be you know chain code is just a piece of code, right? And uh, while you know, I understand you know if it were coming from Ethereum or something, you know, yeah, they do. Uh, I'm sorry, you're not clear. I'm not clear. I'm not clear. It was it, please. Uh, sorry, my bad. So uh, I think, you know, the way that you're saying, you know, the assets, you know, smart contract as an asset, smart contract or a chain code, when it comes to Hyperledger Fabric, it's just a piece of code, right? Uh, it doesn't really hold, you know, everything in its own. Of course, you know, the, when you, you know, implement it and, you know, the channel is the one that is actually hosting, you know, is actually having all the assets that you have defined, right? Uh, smart contract is just a means to accessing them. Yeah. So you can't really, so uh, moving assets from one to another, you know, it can't be directly done, but that's where, you know, I would say that, you know, interoperability comes into the, you know, picture where you have, you know, different means or ways to, you know, go about it, of course. Like, you know, you can have, you know, you can, you know, follow the bridging route or otherwise, you know, you, um, you know, you can use, you know, uh, hybrid ledger kind of a, you know, uh, methodology. But in, in your case, I think you'll have to, you know, create some bridge on, you know, 
as a you know way to you know introduce interoperability and then you know uh, if you, uh, to go into de depth you know about interoperability of course you know hyperledger has you know cacti right uh, which is coming up right yeah, yeah. So we are anyhow you know planning to have a separate session on that where you know we will you know go into details of it so we are actually you know planning it and you mm -hmm. will see that you know if we can have that you know in you know a uh, few weeks mm -hmm. so like in cacti is this like fabric but we can like do we plug in fabric network into cacti and that allows us to do in probability or so we have to build completely from scratch in using cacti no cacti itself is not a network right cacti is a means to you know to connect multiple networks okay yeah so it is actually you know the you know we had hyperledger cactus right so it is actually you know uh, the next you know version of it uh, which we are calling cacti Actually, you know, we have multiple, you know, uh, solutions which are working on the same premise. So, you know, we you know, decided to merge them and, you know, create a new one called the Cacti. So, it will, you will be able to integrate at the, you know, different blockchains, you know, uh, networks and be able to transfer the assets as you, you know, you were mentioning. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I think, you know, uh, with that, you know, I would like to thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone for joining uh, Hyperledger Connect, you know, uh, India 2023 event. So this was our, you know, first event of the season, right? And uh, we are coming up with more events and, you know, we are already in the, you know, uh, in the, you know, means of, you know, creating, you know, planning those new sessions. And, you know, we are planning few workshops as well. So uh, hopefully, you know, you will hear from us soon again, you know, uh, we are planning for Hyperledger, you know, uh, Bevel, Firefly and, you know, Cacti sessions. We are already in the, you know, in the verge of planning those. So we'll keep you posted. I would request you to, you know, those who are not already following, uh, you know, Hyperledger India chapter at LinkedIn, please do that. And using that channel, you know, we'll definitely, you know, reach out to every one of you. And now that, you know, we have a new team. So, uh, you know, dedicated uh, with dedicated responsibilities, you know, uh, I hope that we'll be able to organize more sessions and, you know, connect more uh, with the complete team. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that would be all from my side. Uh, Kamlesh, you there? Yeah, I'm here. I think uh, uh, we can uh, thank you, uh, Ravi and uh, Lakshya and uh, Aditya and everyone uh, who taking the new responsibilities and, uh, yeah, all the best, and let's catch up on every Thursday meeting, and we we could we could work on the planning like how to take this forward the chapter at the new level. So thank you, and thank you, Julian, for joining. Yes, thanks a lot, Julian, for you know by your uh, Saturday <laughs> evening, right? Hey, Vikram and Kamlesh, uh, if you have a few minutes, can I just uh, pitch in? Yeah, 